Blast off I'm live here with Ricky Stanzi, the quarterback and professor of Goda. Ricky, thanks for uh, carving out some time to come on. It's going to be a yeah, lot I'm of fun. Yeah, I'm excited. Thanks for having me on, Pete. I mean, we could have had a show in the pre-show. Yeah, yeah, we, we were, were going there. I was like, let's hit this record button. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll hit the record. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, Mark Malone, the, the quarterback, the uh, old-timer now, I guess, I, I hope he doesn't get mad at me for saying it. He's a mutual friend. Uh, or we have a mutual friend here in Hilton had been trying to coordinate over years about time to get him on. But before we get into Goda and all the golf stuff, I, I had one question I want to ask him that, that you could answer. Cause you, you were a great star quarterback at Iowa. You were played in the NFL. Your career was cut a little short, but I always had wondered that the correlation between quarterbacks. And as we saw the match, you know, Brady plays mm-hmm. and Aaron Rodgers plays the correlation between quarterbacks and the golf game. Cause you're a, you're a big golf fanatic. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I never knew if it was the uh, the precision needed and the similarities. And, and you know, you, uh, you got it as as you go from high school to college, the window to throw into sure. it in college of the pro becomes very, very small. If that was the appeal that, to that type of person or if it's kind of the, the strategic way that you maneuver your way around and you know, the quarterback is guiding the team or at least the offense for, for most of the game and it's a couple mm-hmm. hours. So I guess if that's a – the first question to, to jump into this with is what, what is the appeal of golf to quarterbacks in general? I think the first thing is, and I, I date back to man, eight years old, nine years old, Rick, and you get fascinated with aim small, miss small. You just, you become a marksman. I think that's probably the first piece of it that that foundation gets laid early on um, when you get interested in throwing a football, when you get interested in accuracy and, um, these leadership qualities that they that come around it and sort of you know keeping your composure it's a thinking's man a thinking man's game playing chess and trying to you know um game management course management there's a lot of similarities that carry over like we talked about in the pregame i, I didn't grow up in a golf family i didn't grow up um with a club in my hands i didn't start playing until my third year in the nfl and that was only because i was down in jacksonville uh, my teammates were uh, Blaine Gabbert, Chad Henney, Blake Bortles, and they were they loved golf. And so they got me onto the course. And the first, I'll be honest, the first time I put that club in my hands and the first time I tried to go after it, I was awful. I mean, I couldn't get the ball in the air. I couldn't aim it. I had, <laughs> com- I just had no understanding. And I've always been the good athlete. I was the all-state athlete. I was the guy that put a ball in my hands. I'm going to go make that basket. I'm going to go score that goal. I'm going to get that touchdown. I'll find a way. Like, usually if you're shooting hoops, eventually it starts to kind of go for you. Whereas, like, I'm on the range, and I'm leaving with more questions than when I went into that range session. And then I think quarterbacks, look, you got to spend more time in the film room. You have to know everything that's going on around you. You don't just know your position. So it's like golf. You don't just know your swing. You know where all the hazards are. You know what the next hole brings, and you know where the wind's coming in from. And there's all these details that you have to tie into. And I think years and years of kind of patterning your brain that way and being hyper-focused on details, when you get around golf, like as everybody probably in the golf world or people listening to this, you get that itch, you catch that bug, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it just like, from that moment, I latched onto it. And, you know, it was something that I was not good at to start. And I've slowly tried to etch my way to playing around where I can enjoy it and keep one ball in my pocket, as opposed to just running through a sleeve and trying to, you know, fill up the cooler just to enjoy myself. I now can at least enjoy the finer parts of the game and the little details surrounding the green or putting or, you know, aim. And and I think that's been my whole goal with golf is to just keep progressing. Quarterbacks love to have a challenge in front of them. They love to have something that they need to attain to or need to go find and need to go orient themselves to as far as a goal is or is is concerned and golf's one of those things where you're never going to perfect it and so you kind of go into that with that's the fun part about is that it's always going to be a challenge every time you go out there but the first thing that that really stuck out to me was like this is aim small miss small and I like that because I grew up that way and you know you're finely tuned from a dexterity standpoint you know it used it, it, it was that that cross on the ball and now it's the club face. And, and so you're trying to kind of detail all that stuff out. Um, but that's really what, what got me into it was kind of the quarterback room at Jacksonville. And then just that concept mm-hmm. of like, man, I love the course management. I love the act of the swing. You, you flush a seven iron once, you're hooked, as you guys know that are listening, right? It only takes that one time 
And, you know, sometimes it happens on the 18th and it's that last shot. And you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to build off that. And this next round will be better. But no, like we talked about, I, it's a sport that I'm very I'm kind of happy I found later on because I'm, I'm now mm-hmm. able to I don't have any other sports to focus on. So I can really just kind of focus on this one. And uh, I, I get to be a fan of it. I get to be the outside looking in and I get to meet a lot of great golf professionals in the meantime with what I do at Goda. With with and, and we're going to get into a lot of the fundamentals and principles mm-hmm. of Goda uh, for any listener. I mean, I've had, you know, Hunter's been on uh, Coach Gill was on two years ago. So I, I really like what you guys are doing. I, I remember telling Coach Gill that when I think right around right before COVID got started, I was just kind of surfing instagram mm-hmm. and, and all the usual social media sites and i kept you know go to kept coming up and and obviously i've had back trouble uh, as we talked about earlier but i'm looking at this and like this is this is different this is unique and i, I kind of right. like some unique shit uh i don't you know it, it's the, the run of the mill or, or, or the the mainstream stuff uh, uh, there's there's good qualities to it but as you get further away from the source a lot of what people are being taught or instructed to do kind of deviate from the, the purpose of why that was implemented. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Um, but as far as uh, being a quarterback in, in, in your career and then now understanding and being in the golf, do you see, and, and as far as the goat is concerned, do you see with all the technology and, and advancements in, in sport and everything else and the ability to measure things, do you see that, it's going maybe too far in that is it influencing quarterback position, the golf position and tr- in, in training industry sometimes in a way that gets a little too far from the way that we're meant to move uh, where maybe coaches are changing swings for the, to, to fit it into a, a mold or a box that if they were left a certain way that they'd be able to, to persevere and, and become yeah, better. Yeah. Abs- I mean, I agree with that. And I think that's, it's a loaded question. I think it's a, it's a harmonious blend of both. Like, I think that there's, there's a magic to, as we call it, like me and Gilly would talk about the, uh, the coach's eye, right? It's, it's the Jack Grout. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, that, that old position coach that like, they just have so many years of experience of seeing it, that they have a certain way of communicating and getting that proper behavior or that efficient behavior out of their student, just from years and years of actually putting their eyes on the skill that they're trying to up level. Now, There's that area of expertise that I believe is needed. And I think sometimes that gets put on the back burner for numbers. And I think overall, there's been a push in our society and our culture. And this kind of links to the training as well, where we're obsessed with a one rep max, right? The velo day, right? The, um, you know, swing speed, the yardage and in sport, you know, the sport of golf has even evolved to where you have a long drive competition where you're highlighting these types of things. So I think sometimes those concepts of one rep max of velo, they start to pull you out of a uh, sort of what is more of actual golf, which is a marathon. You know, it's a bunch of organized efficient swings over time that gets you to that end goal, which is to win the match as opposed to just being dialed into velo or just being dialed in, to swing speed, as you know, you can't just swing it out of your shoes every single time. There's some precision that's involved with that. It's the same thing that we've had in quarterback world where like, hey, that's great. You can throw it really hard. That's great. You can throw it really far. But actually what translates on Sunday or Saturday is the accuracy. And I think the same things are probably said um, in the golf world. Not saying you don't want to be able to throw it hard. Not saying you don't want to be able to have some distance, but you got to find a a chance or a place where you can blend all those things. But for us, the backbone is always going to be longevity. Like no matter how we try to carve this thing out, the golf season's long. The the round of golf is long. The golf weekend of four days is long, right? And so the football Mm -hmm. season is long. Those types of things are implying a marathon, a longevity sort of principle. And if we don't account for efficiency inside of that model, well, then we're not even going to be there to compete. So there's just sort of trying to to blend both, trying to blend the advances in technology. We want to use that technology to our advantage. We do. Um, We use slow motion video. That's the backbone of what we do at Goda. Part of the reason for that is Gilly 
grew up in the golf world. And the golf world is really one of the first places that is using slow motion frame by frame as like the gospel. That's what they're using. They're using Mm -hmm. that over and over again. And that's the eye in the sky that never lies. That's part of what spoke to me um, when I first got introduced to Gota was I've been watching slow motion video on VHS since eighth grade as a quarterback. So that's the world I know. I was told eye in the sky never lies since a very young age. So when somebody was finally like, hey, here's the efficient way we should be moving. And here's how you look at it. You, you use frame by frame video. I'm like, well, this is perfect. So I think you take that blend of the Jack Grouts or another person that comes to mind is my dad was a boxer and he had a boxing coach and, and he was saying things like heels up and he was saying things like tail back. And he was doing all this without a slow motion video camera, just from seeing the more fluid, more efficient boxers over a long period of time. And so I think there's a blend of like, you got to put your reps in as a coach. You've got to put your reps in as a player. You got to get your eyes on your skill and you have to kind of saturate your brain around that movement around that sport and you want to be able to use technology to help that skill set so i think it's a nice blend of having frame by frame technology listen it's nice to have these iphones and these ipads and these macbooks where you can sync all your video up and you can put it into nice organized folders and it's nice to have these pressure maps and these swing speeds and you can sort of correlate is is my training working is it not working um it's just finding the blend where we don't push too far, where we don't push the technology away and now we're kind of in the dark, but we don't go so far into that technology world where now we're not even just trusting our instincts and we're not trusting that coaching eye, which as athletes, we all know that that thing holds a heavy weight and that you can't, you can't always use technology to make up for experience. Like there is going to be that moment where you got to trust your gut, you got to trust your instincts. So I think there's a blend in there somewhere. I'm sure sometimes it gets pushed to either end of the spectrum, but that's all we're kind of in the middle of working all that out right now. It seems like. Yeah. As it relates to the golf industry and and I've had, I mean, if anyone that knows the golf world, they get and look at my guest list. It's pretty impressive. And then I've been not to say that I'm great at what I do. It's just, I, I, you know, I spend almost an entire life in the Mm -hmm. golfing world, played professionally, met a lot of people who knew people and got connected but as I had them on the show, and, and the very the thing that, that I've found very interesting that I had the theory on, which is exactly what you just described, it's great to have the technology to measure, but you have to, one, know what you're reading, and, and two, know how to take that information and utilize it to the benefit of the person that you're helping or yourself. But what I found very interesting was the further that the information got from the source, that the more bastardized it became. And, and the more that the person using it was relying on the technology and not on the, the eye and usually because the eye wasn't very trained and uh, the, the one of the perfect examples is scott Cox was he's an, the canadian pga teacher of the year and he, he's very big uh he's an ambassador i believe for hack motion which measures wrist positions throughout the swing and on the show i said do you, I, I assumed he used it all the time and he said no i'll use it when we start to, to see where their positions are and I'll use it after I make my changes and give them time to adapt to see how far we've come. And then I, it, it, that tells me I need to know what to go do mm-hmm. to tweak here and there. It, it'll tell you what path to take mm-hmm. from there on. So the, 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 the best who are perceived to be using all this inf- or technology all the time, they're using it, but they're using it as a checkpoint. They're not using it as, as mm-hmm. the end all. Where I, I think, again, as it gets, passed down and, and, and you know you, for golf you have some assistant working in a shop and this is not to to bash on them or in the training industry you have someone fresh out of college th- they're going to use all these different training aids or yeah. devices and because they don't have the experience but they're not helping that they could actually hurt the person there with i've heard you talk about that yeah. plenty uh on different episodes th- th- and and youtube it's, and everything else like it's one of those things where like when you start measuring where do you stop like th- that, and that's an honest question. Like you can just keep measuring until you're at a point of paralysis by analysis. Like, you know, and that's not to say that feel is always real, but like you're saying there, and mm-hmm. I, I totally agree with that. There's a nice blend between both of them. And I, like, I always kind of relate everything back to the football world. Cause that's where, you know, I come from, but we see this now with the analytic department, you know, that was never a thing when we were young, like it was just all gut instincts and coaching and, you know, they've been in the, the business long enough that they, 
And now it's like you see people make decisions on Saturday or Sunday, and we, you know, looking at a TV, like, what? What is ha- what you're doing? You're going for it, and it's like, <laughs> well, that's what the guy from MIT and the thing said. It's like that dude's never been on a field. Like he's never even left the box. And, you know, it's like sometimes you're like, wait, wait a second. Like we can't just completely abandon the gut instinct and the momentum shifts and the feels of you know what just happened the play before the series before in golf what just happened the hole before you know where are you currently on the course what swing how does it feel like that isn't always going to be able to be relayed into a computer there has to be some sort of instincts that are playing playing a role but yeah it's great to have a tool that you can refer back to you know if we don't have the slow motion video the other problem with that is it's too fast for us to see so it's like you you want mm-hmm. that harmonious blend because that's what's allowing us to get some of these calls correct in a football world or that's what's allowing you to dial in those little maybe that missing detail of wrist position that in fast motion you just can't quite see it but when you go frame by frame you can tar- start to discern you know, where your training should go. And and I've always been a big, like being as an athlete, don't waste my time. Like, do not waste my time. I need to know the why. I need to know the how. I'm not just here looking for circus acts. Like I want to get better. My goal is to get back on the field. I'm not trying to sit in the lab all day and just, I want to go compete. So sometimes when you're in the number world, you get stuck in the lab. And then like the training almost becomes the sport almost becomes the act. Whereas you've got to get out there and you've actually got to play. You've actually got to put yourself in those tough shot scenarios. Like I've heard this from a ton of golfers and I know it to be true just from trying to progress in the game. You can sit on the range all you want, but the reality is Mm -hmm. you got to go out and play the game. You got to play 18 holes. You can't just keep hitting your seven iron because that's not how it plays out in, in, um, you know, on the course, like you're going to hit your driver, then you maybe grab your seven and then you're grabbing your 56. And then it's like, you need to be able to, you got one lick at it, kid. Like you got to go ahead. You got to be able to flush that bad shot and move on. You don't get six shots in between to make a change. So I think there's, like you're saying that there's a healthy blend. It works best when you have a situation, like you said, a coach who is well seasoned, that eye is seasoned and there's no replacement for that. I don't think you can replace that. You need to be able to see it. There has to be a dialogue exchange between coach, between athlete, and there has to be an understanding that, hey, feel isn't always real. My cues in my head and in my body may not exactly translate to this person. And so I've got to be able to say the same thing 10 different ways just to get the replica of what I want to show up on tape. But those people that use the tape the right way are, like you said, they've got tons of years tons of experience of just looking at it, not only frame by frame, but looking at it in real time and then understanding what that little microcosm of maybe a football throw or a golf swing. Well, what is that when you take that and you put it into pressure pack situations and you put it with a downhill lie or you put it with some rough underneath it? Like when does it change then? Cause now I got to know those variables. A lot of that stuff, once again, it could get measured out into oblivion or you can make a clear decision, go with it, aim and fire. Yeah, you know, as as we talked before, and, and I've done a lot of different uh, training types or disciplines mm-hmm. or modalities. However, you want to fill in that blank. Uh, foundation mm-hmm. training that we talked about, and yep. Eric Goodman and Jesse, I think they're doing some really good stuff, and and a lot of similarities in that. Obviously, Gilly was with the yep. Agoscu, uh school training, um, uh, the Aldoa, uh, Givoyes Aldoa. I don't know if you're I familiar with that it, yes. at all. It, it, it's, it's a, like decompre- a of, yeah, joint yeah, decompression kind of like to create length and yes. a lot of these ideas around yes, length versus compression. Yes. Yes. So, so and so it, it, as I have experienced all these things, cause I got mm-hmm. a banged up body and I'm 50 years old and I'd look to try to keep it from getting worse. I, I have noticed, uh, uh, and, and these are the ones I've used, but they're also the ones that have worked for myself, but a lot of other golfers in particular and athletes in general. And it seems to be that there's universal mm-hmm. movements. And, and to, to use an example, the, the outsides of the feet mm-hmm. being parallel and in the columns. So can, can you just, uh, uh, from, from, uh, as a GOTA, Professor Agoda and, and one of the leading GOTA individuals out there, can you just explain that a little bit to somebody who might be listening and they're just introduced to, to yeah, GOTA right yeah. now? So like the way that we would format the foot from a, 
conceptual standpoint, from a, from an analogy standpoint, to help you kind of get a picture in your mind of how this thing should operate. I like to use the analogy of a joystick. So we've, you know, whether you played Atari or you got a new Xbox, you're familiar with the concept of a joystick, right? So the joystick is sitting inside of a platform. So that platform isn't going to move so that the joystick can move, right? So you have a strong, stable, almost rigid platform that's going to hold still and hold strong, be that foundation for the joystick to then create this beautiful spiral movement that allows you to move that character on the screen. Well, now take that to the body. The platform would be your foot. So if you look at your foot compartment as sort of the platform of the joystick, it's going to hold a certain shape. It's going to hold a certain behavior, as we would say. We call that inner ankle bone high. It's essentially just saying that the foot needs to almost build up into like a half dome arch structure. If you kind of look at the foot anatomy and how it's designed, it's already giving you hints of this. If you look at that straight foot alignment, the, the big toe side of the foot drawing back to the heel is like a cliff side, right? Whereas the toes actually cascade in their size, almost like a Wi-Fi signal, down to the outside corner. So like a gutter effect, more of the pressure should kind of funnel into the outer corner because you're building a nice half dome arch structure. Now, from there, take everything else upstream, right? So we call that, you know, the foot's the platform of the column. The column would be mm -hmm. the side of the body. You have two sides of the body. You have two columns, as we call them. Inside that column, you now have a shin compartment. That's the joystick, the thigh compartment, the torso, the bicep, the forearms. You got an upper limb. You got a lower limb. You got a shared torso, two sides of the body, two columns. Both those columns have a foot foundation, a foot platform. Now, that platform needs to hold steady. It needs to hold still. And then that shin can operate like a joystick. So the shin does the movement, right? And so that's kind of the basis or the beginning of Goda is saying that, hey, this foot can't be moving. It needs to hold this half dome arch structure. Then that allows the shin to create a multi-planar turn. And so when I'm teaching it, sometimes I'll, I'll compartmentalize or I'll bring a microscope to just the shin. Because I, I tell coaches, I tell athletes, if you can conceptualize what the shin is doing, well, then by default, you've already said what the thigh is doing. By default, because they all have to play together. They all have to work in harmony. And like a spiral staircase, and this is where we tie in the walk is the run, is the throw, is the swing. When you're putting your foot in the ground to take a step, your foot's going to hold that shape. You're going to essentially do a backswing and a downswing on every single step throughout your day. You're going to do a loading and you're going to do a transferring. So we have... Each system of the body is moving something, okay? Inside of the musculoskeletal system, we're moving pressure. Now, in the golf world, maybe you call that weight transfer. So I'm going to transfer my weight, right? I'm going to load it up onto one side, and then I'm going to throw it over to the other side. Well, that same thing happens in your walk. It just happens on a much quieter scale. The stride length is a little bit smaller. You're not trying to be as explosive as you are when you're hitting a drive, but it's still nonetheless, a pressure wave exchange. So if you look at each system of the body, each system of the body is moving something, right? Cardiovascular system is working on a cadence. It's working on a rhythm. It's working on a cycle. It's moving the blood. The digestive system, it's working on a cadence. It's working on a rhythm. It's moving the food. The musculoskeletal system, it's working on a rhythm. It's working on a cadence. It's moving pressure, weight transfer. So you're going to wave pressure into a column. You're going to wave pressure out. Now, what we've observed is that when the healthy body waves this pressure in and out, certain things take place. They have more or less a straight foot. Their foot is stable in, in an inside ankle bone high shape like that platform of the joystick. And then the shin, the thigh, the torso, the upper limb, they all turn like you would be going down a spiral staircase. It's a multi-planar turn like your backswing. It just goes down, back, and out. And then when you want to transfer over to the other side, you now retrace your steps on that spiral staircase and you go up, around, and in. And so that sort of pumping of the column as pressure goes in and goes out would be the bow and the corner, the backswing and the downswing. But it kind of all starts at, obviously, the foundation because that pressure has got a bottleneck up through the base of the foot. So how we organize that foot, how we sort of set the precedent there is going to determine the harmony as we move upstream. And as you can already kind of picture in your mind, 
If my foot's doing one thing and my shin's doing another and my thigh's doing another, well, that would be disharmony. And if we have disharmony, mm -hmm. it's almost like pouring crazy glue into your joystick compartment. Well, you've got movement in some areas, but not movement as a whole. And when you start to shut off certain areas of movement, you start to compensate. You can get away with compensation for a little bit, but as it compounds, it starts to break down. It starts to limit you just like it would limit that character on the screen that you were trying to move with that joystick. And, and as far as, as that relates to golfers, it, it someone who's a golfer and you, you're obviously expert in, in your field. Where do you see most golfers getting it wrong? At the foot level. So like we talked about earlier, like it's a well-known global law of golf that you can't have this early extension move, right? It's, it's something you're trying to work out of. And I would say that I think coaches are even pushing it even further. Now you see the Dustin Johnson's um, you see some of these guys that are high level swinging as we would call it the tail to crown relationship that you see at a dress where the tail sits back, the crown sits forward, almost like an athletic position. These guys are even stretching that even further as they go into their downswing and they make their move towards the ball. So like that's a global law that's been well documented in golf. Don't shoot your, your tailbone. Don't shoot your belt buckle to the ball. And so people are doing a good job there. But what I see a lot in the golf world, and this goes to all different sports is errors at the foot level. And I think one of the big problems we've had in not only golf, but this probably translates maybe a lot from the weight room is this cue of drive through your heels, drive through your heels. Whereas at Gota, what we tell people in order to get that half dome arch structure, in order to be athletic, it shouldn't take much thinking to, to kind of picture what that athletic position is like. You're truly in the ball of your foot. Now that's not saying you're on your tippy toes. I'm saying you're in the, the rib eye of the foot, the prime rib of the foot, the meat of the foot is actually that ball of the foot. So we tell athletes drive down through the balls of the feet and up through the heels. So this is going to liberate that joystick. So when you put your heel down, what happens is you jam up the shin bone. So when you put the heel down, you're going to lock the expression of the shin bone. Well, when you lock the shin bone, the thigh just has a little, some knee attachments in between the thigh bone and the shin bone. So if my thigh is getting locked up necessarily kind of more or less being ski booted, not being able to express its full range or be in harmony with the thigh bone, well, now you've got a situation where your thigh's doing something and your shin's doing something else. And so you start to see a lot of golfers deal with a ton of either, as I would say, the bottom of the thigh bone, which would be knee problems, or the top of the thigh bone, which would be hip problems. But the real root problem is at that foot level, right? Their, their platform is collapsing. They're getting heavy into the heel. They're not truly in the ribeye of the foot, which is really from, if you were to draw a line straight down from your outer ankle bone. So that outer ankle bone that if you guys are listening, that you can kind of touch and see the, the fibula, if you will, you can put your hands on it. There's a bone that sits right underneath that. It's called the cuboid. And it's like this big cube-like shaped structure. And it's a big bone. And it, it sort of bridges the gap between the metatarsals and the heel. You're allowed to be heavy into that cuboid. I just don't want you to kind of cross that line, cross that tri trip wire. And now you're too heavy in the heel. So there's like this very nuanced detail at the foot level simplified, I tell people, drive down through the balls of your feet and up through the heels because it will liberate the shin. Now your shin can be that joystick. And now when, you're, when your foot is strong enough, and that takes time to recode and repattern, and you can't just step up to the driver or step up to the first tee and say, hey, feet, be strong. Like it doesn't necessarily work that way. You kind of got to back yourself <laughs> down, build up your strength, and then work your way back up. Um, and once we get our athletes, our golfers, to get a stronger ball of the foot, now the column sits up on a, a totally new foundation. Now the shin stays open and closed in harmony with the thigh and in harmony with the torso and the upper limb. So now they're able to get into a full, the fullest expression of the backswing that their coach wants them to get into. And they're able to make that smooth transition move where you can actually shallow out the club now. And you can do all the different things that you look to do as far as shaping shots and kind of getting that, that club face to get to the ball the way that you want to, but it's only through really liberating that foot and ankle that you'll find a way to have longevity. And I think that's probably the next piece is that, you know, you can get away with 
with compounding bad behaviors. We know this, right? Like there's guys that are tough as nails. Tiger Woods, tough as nails. You know, there's a lot of golfers that are, they're beating up their right side, <clears throat> they're their trail leg, and they're beating up their front side. They're beating up that post-up leg. And, mm -hmm. and it, I'm pushing it all back to, and I'm probably simplifying it, but if you really look at their feet, it's a lot of heavy heels when if we just got more into the ball of the foot and let that heel hover, we could eliminate all these knee, Achilles, foot, hip, back problems. Is that a, a position that's set in at, at a dress or uh, as someone sets up? Because the, I guess if, if, you, if I can call it traditional golf instruction, is it would depend <laughs> on the, the ability of the golfer to turn on their backswing and or their fo yep. uh, forward swing. Uh, wh where the foot position would be set. So, for example, if they had limited mobility in their trail hip, that they would yep. flare the foot out, let's say, 20 degrees, and then that would, in theory, allow them to turn more. But it, it sounds like, well, is, is there a position that, that works better as far as Goda would, would say, hey, if you did yeah. this with your foot position, and, and then if it didn't work, you know, you do a little bit of the, we yep. can prescribe this, and eventually you'll start working better with a limited uh potential to hurt yep. yourself so what what would that be what would the go to foot position at an address for say a mm -hmm. any no, full I'm glad swing you brought beat. that 20 degree number because that's what we we call it the 22 and a half degree bow so when you're loading that column properly the kneecap should point out 22 and a half degrees and this is where it's like dude people are right around it they're so close they know that like hey i gotta get that foot i gotta get something open to around 22 and a half degrees what we try to bring to the golf world it's like yes Correct. It does open, but the foot can hold still as your shin opens to 22 and a half degrees. So if you've got a strong foot in a mobile ankle, a mobile joystick, you can theoretically hold your foot straight as you still achieve this 22 and a half degree turn in the column. Now, like you said, if you're a golfer that's always walked around with crooked feet, you work a nine to five, you sit a bunch, your hips are pressed forward. I can't ask you to have a straight foot and still get to that 22 number, that magical number that you want to get to. So in order to make the round go the way you want and to get the task at hand accomplished, yes, of course, turn your feet out because that's how you're going to hit better shots. That's how you're going to score better rounds. And that's how you're going to meet the goals that you want. But what we're trying to bring to people's attention is that that only goes so far because you're compounding a bad behavior that if we just took a step back and we corrected it, and yes, we do get a 22-5, but it's a 22-5 from a shin turn on top of a straight foot. So to answer your question, ideally you could keep your feet straight and you'd be able to turn your shins to a 22 and a half degree turn down, back and out, and then close them a full 45 degrees in and then let that trail heel release away as you pick up that foot and release all the pressure and then gather it up into your front column, <clears throat> your, your post column, I guess is what they would call it. Is that what you guys call it? Trail leg post. Yeah. If, if, I've heard it post, post up, up on the front, the front leg. Yeah. A bunch of different terms, but and that's the leg that's getting chewed on as well. So you have a situation where if you go crooked foot to allow yourself to get into the backswing. So now you can achieve this backswing that you want. Well, the problem with the crooked foot is the shin once again is going to start to get arrested a little bit, but there's still this turn happening above that shin. So you're going to crank on that knee over and over and over again. And then when you go to bring the club down and you go to transition into your downswing, you're going to do what we call cutting the corner. So because your foot's crooked and the shin needs to turn, in order to get that shin to turn, you just collapse the foot. It's the only way to do it. Whereas if you can keep a straight foot, then you can do what we call cornering, where as you're turning and you've seen, I've seen guys like JT, they've been able to do this. He's starting to lose it a little bit on his back leg, but and young Charlie Woods was able to do it. He's starting to lose it a little bit. But what you'll see is as their knee goes in on the downswing, the inside of the foot and the heel immediately goes up and away. And it looks distinctly different yeah. from what you will see on a cutting of the corner, which is when the knee goes in, the inside of the foot and the heel actually goes down in with it. So if someone's knee is going in on the trail leg, and the inside ankle bone and the inside of the heel is going down and in at the same cadence, that's what we call cutting in the corner. That is going to create this harmony between the foot, between the shin, between the thigh. Now you're, now you're up for any sort of itis, some sort of MCL issue. The knees can get shredded. There's a list of bad things that can happen. If you can do what a young Charlie Woods, a JT does, where as the knee moves in, the inside of the foot 
and the heel actually climb up and away because remember that joystick concept. As they're turning the joystick up around and in, the half dome arch structure platform, it don't move. It stays strong, and you really see the ball of a foot shine in that moment on downswing where it's like it looks like they're almost doing a calf raise because they have just such a nice mm -hmm. presence through the ball of the foot, and that shin just comes up around and in, and it allows you to create that downswing. So that's a slight difference there in foot position. Yes, you want to be able to get to this, this 20, 22-degree number is a magical number, but you want to be able to do it off of a straight foot. And then the front side leg, the post-up leg, I would argue that that one's under even more stress. Because it's a pressure wave exchange, you're going to, you know, you watch these, yeah, you watch these pressure maps, you're going to see like, these. some guys get it 80-20, I'd say probably roughly 70-30, where it's like backside pressure to front side pressure. We know that a lot of the greatest golfers all lifted that front heel. It's the same thing that you see in a good football throw. The front leg lifts up. It's the same thing you see in a good baseball swing. The front leg lifts up. You see it in a baseball pitch. You got to unweight that leg to weight the other leg, right? You got to get your weight back mm -hmm. to truly get all of you behind that swing. So you're going to unweight your front leg to weight your back leg. And then when you go to transfer, you're just going to do it the opposite. Now you're going to weight the front leg to unweight the back leg. Well, when you're weighting this front leg in your transition into your downswing, when you're handling your follow through, picture a tornado, picture a hurricane. You've got hurricane hips. You've got all this energy. That's why the heel whips away from the midline. You've got, that's like the trail storm, the outsides of a tornado. It's whipping around a corner. There's a point, which would be your foot and energy will course around that foot, just like the other pivot point energy systems in the universe. I could look at, I could take you down to a cell dividing and you'll see a point and you'll see energy cascade around it. I could take you 40,000 foot mm -hmm. view to watch a hurricane turn. You'll see a point and you'll see energy turn around it. You got the same mechanism playing out your column, your foothold still, that's the point. There's sort of an imaginary line up through that. And there's this energy coursing around it. Well, as you know, think of the swing speed numbers now. Think of how much force and how much pressure is being built into your trail leg and then being thrown into your front leg. So now you've got to negotiate all this pressure on your release and your follow through. You got to catch all this pressure. If I'm a right-handed golfer, I got to catch it into my left leg. Well, once again, platform analogy, if I'm used to catching all that pressure on my front heel or collapsing my foot, you're going to ski boot your shin, but then think about how much momentum is carrying mm. into your follow through. So now picture a shin not moving and then picture the thigh, the torso, the upper limbs all going around the corner. Well, now you can see why a Michelle Wee, an Ernie Els, a Brooks Kepka, a Dustin Johnson, they're blowing up their front leg. We see this, you know, we call it block leg, but they're getting their front heel into the ground. They're getting a straight knee. They're not able to soften the knee and get out of the heel and let the shin and the thigh stay on the same page into the release and follow through. We see it in our quarterback world. We see it in our pitching world. The golfer and the pitcher, I would argue, get probably more wrecked than the quarterback or maybe even the infielder in baseball because the quarterback doesn't have to swing or throw at top speed. We get to kind of play more of a pace game, whereas a golfer is getting to top speed a lot of the time. That driver is a big swing. You're practicing that a lot. Mm -hmm. Your pitcher is trying to throw 100 miles an hour. And I think that's why you probably see more front leg explosions in the golf and the pitching world. But it's all centered around the same behavior. They're trying to catch pressure with their heel down. The shin gets locked. Everything keeps going. And it's going to burn up, like I said, either the bottom of that thigh bone or the top of that thigh bone. And then everything in between is running a risk of some sort of itis. There's a million different names and a million different symptoms, essentially, that you could have playing out. But the root cause, the root of the problem is really at the root of the column, which will be your foot. Is, is there anything for somebody who might be at home listening that, that they can do a, a test to check themselves to see if, if they have the correct uh, shin mm -hmm. mobility or, or the mobility at the ankle joint? Because someone like me, you know, I played a lot of basketball yeah. as a kid and all middle school, high school, and I might, I bet I must have oh, yeah. sprained, tore my ankles at least six, seven, seven times each. So I've had him, you know, my, the podiatrist and, and the guy was looking at my ankle one day and he could sit there and pull my ankle. He said, look at all my, this, is this isn't good. But, but my, but my mobility in my ankle is, is horrendous. Like, 
dorsiflexion, I can barely get my mm -hmm. foot to 90 degrees. So it, it, there's a lot of play in there because they've been so stretched out and so damaged. But the um, the flexibility, I, I, maybe that's a bad word, oh, but it's yeah, the only word I can come right. up with right now, is terrible. So if someone's at home right now, what what would they do that they could check themselves to get themselves a baseline and then they get with, you know, they could call yeah. up a goater. You know, I'll, I'll, of course, I'll have a link to all your guys' stuff, but they can get on there and then schedule an appointment. But just for the sake of mm -hmm. them checking themselves now, what, what, what should they do or so could the they do? So the first thing I would home? say is like, if you're somebody who is in pain, then you're not GOTA, right? Like you just already off the bat, like if you're someone that's, that's able to list off all your injuries and maybe you had a knee replacement or you've had some, some itises, you're going to be, falling into more of what we would call a WOTA category where you've lost some of that GOTA. This is an innate, this is a, a innate behavior. It's, it's built into the embryological um, design. So it's something that we're all given. We just slowly lose it because we wear funny shoes and we sit in chairs all day. And then we put bad patterns into other areas mm -hmm. of our life. So the first test is like, which, where are your, where do your toes point? So if you look down at your feet and you're somebody that's toes crooked, meaning that they're pointing out, that's going to be a sign of locked ankles. And that person that's listening to this and they're like, yeah, dude, I do have crooked feet. You're probably also battling with some sort of knee pain. And if it's not manifesting at the knee level, then it's probably showing up into the back because now you're starting to push the hips forward to kind of counterbalance what you're doing at the foot level. So that's kind of one of our first tests is like, do I stand with a fist width distance apart between my feet? Do I stand with my second toe straight? And if I am standing fist width distance apart, second toe straight, if I was to kind of look in the mirror and I didn't have any socks on and I had my shorts pulled up and I could kind of see that whole shin and foot compartment is the inner ankle bone, that bony protrusion that you could see on the inside versus the bony protrusion you could see on the outside. Is it angled such that it's almost like the roof of a house? Like if you were to look at your feet and you were to kind of flush your two feet together and your shin bones together, you should more or less have a roof of a house where the inside is tilted, mm -hmm. the outside is tilted down. Because once again, and you, this is even like in the design of the bones, like the tibia that just naturally sits on that 22, five, and the more you look for this 22, five, it starts, the angle just shows up everywhere inside the geometry of the design in the body. So um, that's like the first test that we ask people, like, are your feet straight? Are, are your feet close? Cause a lot of people, what we generally see in one of the, the quick, couple cues that we give people to fix their standing, to fix their walking. As we always push it into the golf world, we call it the non-negotiables. You know, I'm not going to sit there and try to claim that I know everything about the swing. I'm not qualified in that. I would, I would call up a guy like you, Peter. I would call up Hunter Gathright. I call up Brian Gathright, but there are these things we call the non-negotiables. This is going to be standing around waiting for the next shot, walking to the next shot. There's probably more time spent in that world than there is actually swinging the golf club. So mm -hmm. in your standing, in your walking, three things that we often tell our athletes, our clients to help them counteract this is we say feet close, feet straight, eggshell heels. And eggshell heels is just to imply don't, don't crunch the eggshell, right? Be very gentle with the heel. That allows you to kind of put more pressure into the ball of the foot, into the ribeye of the foot. And that's a good sort of quick three cues to start to snap back into when you're just standing when you're walking and we say those three cues because oftentimes this initial test, most people are not feet close, right? Their feet are about hip width distance as opposed to fist width distance. If you actually look at underneath the hood at the anatomy, your hip, that ball and socket, that actual like ball is about three inches off the midline. So it's actually much closer to the spine than we probably give it credit for in our mind's eye. We think our hip width distance is like the outside edge of the hips where that's like the greater trochanter, the mm -hmm. edge of it. It's actually much closer to the midline. So your general standing, your general walking should be more fist width. So most people, they're outside of that, right? They got a crooked foot. Yeah. And that, that, that's, that's fit with, fist width yeah, at the like ball fist of the width foot. between both feet. From, from inside yeah, ball like to can, inside right. ball. Yeah. So, so someone out there who, who, who's yep. not familiar, if, 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 you, if, you, if, you bend, if you're standing, bend down and put make a fist right and put between it between the balls, the balls of your feet. feet. And try to see. If, if the balls of your feet aren't touching your fists on you're each side, wide. then you're too so wide. Most people are already outside that. That's like the general first thing I see. Then we say feet straight because, like I said, most people, if they were to look at that the line because a lot of people got crooked toes nowadays because the feet they got bunions and everything so i tell them to point their second toe and they're like well it's all mangled I don't, 
take the line between your, your big toe and your second toe. And just imagine that line was a laser pointer, okay? And it's shining its light to infinity. Where would that light be shining as you looked off into the, dis- off into the distance? Would it be shining straight ahead? Or would it have like that 22 degrees? Would it be pointing outward? A lot of people have a deviation off of straight because they've had their hips pressed forward so much. They've had their heels in the ground. They've got to now create this compensation. They've got to now turn their foot out, just like you have to turn your foot out on your backswing to let your hip sit back. You're now having to turn your foot out because you've more or less made a fankel. You took your foot and your ankle and you glued it together and you're going to just turn that foot out because you want to harness that glute. You want to harness that back pocket and you'll do whatever you need to do to get a good backswing because you're trying to drive the ball down the fairway, right? You're going to handle the task at hand. You're going to do whatever it is you need to do. Your brain's not necessarily smart in the sense that it's going to go, hey, let's auto correct because we got 18 holes here and you've got another 40 years to live. Like, don't just do that. You know what I mean? It doesn't think that way. You have to kind of recognize good patterns and bad patterns and move from there. But most people are crooked. So most people's feet are wide. Most people's feet are crooked. And then kind of what goes right in with that is that they're very heavy in their heels. Like I'll get down on the ground and I'll kind of grab a person's heel and I'll be like, lighten this thing up. And like they try to go to the ball of the foot and you see the gyroscopes, you see sort of the inner ear just sort of try to recalibrate because it just hasn't been hanging out in the ball of the foot. They've more or less been hanging out on the inside of the foot. They've been hanging out on the inside corner, on the big toe and on the heel. And like I said, when you do that, you collapse the inside of the foot. Remember this design we talked about early on where the inside of the foot's the cliff side. Notice how the toes cascade like a Wi-Fi signal. It's all like a gutter effect, meaning you should have the majority of the pressure cascading like a slope, like you're surfing a slope or snow, snowboarding down a slope. Your foot should almost be that hill. It should be that roof. It should kind of cascade down to the outer corner of the foot. And most people don't have that. Their foot's collapsed. Their foot's compressed. And with that, takes a joystick down and in. And then the joystick gets a bunch of crazy glue put into it. And now it can't quite turn anymore. So now in order to get the expression that you want at the hip, well, you start turning the foot. And then this thing just gets stuck. The shin's stuck. And now your knee's just getting chewed on. And that's why you're seeing so many meniscus problems. You're seeing a lot of MCLs, ACLs, and then eventually it just becomes, well, we got to get this joint replaced. It, it, it Does it go as, even into the shoes? Because I, I know in, in talking to, to mm-hmm. Doc Eric Goodman, when, I, when he was on the show, he had mentioned that as soon as there's any lifting of the heel, that, that the pelvis automatically mm-hmm. tilts forward. So, and then I, you know, the zero shoes and the, uh, what, what are the one that, uh, I was watching you on Mark Bell's podcast earlier this morning. Um, the shoes that those guys wear that, that they're yeah. zero drop yeah. and they got wide yeah. toe box. Well, I, I can't think of them, but anyway, as far as, is there a, a beneficial shoe that, that you recommend for, not that I'm trying to get your promoted company or anything, but like I've had Charlie Hudak, who's, a, he's now the, one of the lead designers for foot joy. And after Gilly came on, I called Charlie and says, Hey, have you guys ever considered making a shoe with, with mm-hmm. all zero drop and a wider toe box? And he said, yeah, actually he, he was working on one, but the, the feedback from all the tour yeah, guys, I'm they sure hated. they did. Uh, Probably and, uncomfortable to play a full round. So, yes. But if you're mm-hmm. cramping the toes, so your, your, your toes, everything's jammed up and then you're trying to get some sensory uh, feedback, proprioception from the ground and then as you unwind, your, your yep. toes are jammed up and you don't have any balance. It's It's got to wreak havoc on, on the entire system Absolutely. and fractals in, in your guys' language. It, what what type of – do you have any type of shoe that you play golf in or, yeah. or um, yeah. that no. you guys recommend? To kind of start with a shoe golfers? recommendation, I play in the Jordan 1s. So Jordan 1s have, have come out recently, a ton of different colorways. A uh, pl- little plug for Nike. Mm-hmm. I'm not sponsored by Nike. I wish I was. Maybe this will help. Um, but the Jordan shoe, the Jordan 1, if you take it back to like 85 when it came out, it's kind of at the cusp of like the shoe revolution, if you will, where it became more of like a mm-hmm. bigger, boxier shoe. So it's got – there's these three things that you're looking for in a shoe, essentially. You want a wide enough toe box for your feet to splay. You want no arch support to minimal arch support. And then you want, like you alluded to, a zero drop. So what that means is like picture your your Chuck Taylor, your Vans, um, picture just from the heel to the toe, 
there's no sort of lift. So it's not a high lift, not like a picture of a high heel shoe being a drastic display of a heel lift. And then like, you know, you think of your like average running shoe, it's got some sort of heel lift. Now to kind of piggyback off of what, what Dr. Goodman is, is alluding to is what's happening with that heel lift is that you're, you're lifting in that heel, but that's not the same as, you know, being in the ball of your foot. So you can have a heel lift in your shoe and still be heavy in your heel. And now you're actually crunching the Achilles. Mm -hmm. But then like he's saying, because it's uh, pitched this way and you're kind of shoving into your heel that way, you're not only crunching the Achilles, but to counterbalance that, you're now shooting your hips forward. So it's just a big mess overall because you're supposed to be barefoot more or less. You're supposed to be in something minimal. Um, A lot of the shoes back in the day, I mean, I marvel at when I look at like old, you know, photos of Bill Russell and Jerry West and, and Pistol Pete and, and even Jordan in the early days, they were playing in Chucks and Converse and they were playing in, you know, <laughs> shoes that like you put that on, a you know, us today and you'd be like, whoa, where's the support? Like we have no idea how far we've kind of shoved our feet into these sensory deprivation chambers. Now, the only there's a couple golf companies, I think, that are pushing towards a more minimalist design. The one that I know is is centered around that is True Linkswear. So True as in T R U E Linkswear, and they've got some really nice designs, um, aesthetically pleasing, that will give you more or less what you're looking for from those three categories. They'll give you a wide enough toe box, they'll give you a minimal arch support, and they'll give you a zero drop. Now, that being said, you're on your feet a lot during a round, so. It's a noticeable difference when you finish around wearing a minimalist shoe than where when mm-hmm. you're maybe wearing a foot joy or something like that, where it's got a little more cushion and it's got a little more, you know, strength at the base of it, if you will, to kind of counteract and let, you know, they really let your feet almost act as if they're sitting on a sofa. It lets your foot get lazy. And that's part of the issue. I think if, a, if the shoe designers in golf, just to start, just open the toe box a little bit. Like I look at the foot joys and I'm like, man, dude, give mm-hmm. me a little bit of space. Like they, those things like, and I understand the aesthetics because it co- it's a gentleman's game. So it comes from the, from the dress world, the, yeah. the dress casual world. So that aesthetics always played into it. Minimalist shoes just don't look cool. They're, they're they, they, like, they really don't aesthetically look cool. That's part of the reason why I'm more of a Jordan. I mean, Jordan to me is the greatest athlete of all time. So I'm like, all about Michael Jordan's, you know, shoe line. That being said, if you're looking for like a stylish minimalist shoe that gives you the benefits, that would be the one to go with because it's going to give you those types of things that you're looking for, which is a wide enough toe box to where you can kind of, you know, more or less open up your toes and not feel like you're so crammed. And then it's going to give you that old school Converse Chuck Taylor vibe where it's a minimalist uh, arch support. And then it is mm-hmm. just zero drop. There's really just a flat old sole. It's old school like that. So that's a good shoe to kind of, if you're like, I don't really want to wear true links wear. And I don't, I don't blame you in some regards because it is one of those things where <laughs> and I'm not saying that from a design standpoint, you guys will look at true links wear and you're like, Oh, these look cool. Cause they do, they, they look good. But the problem is, it's just like, it's tough to just take your foot out of what you're used to and then just throw it onto the course in a minimalist shoe. Like that's almost kind of a bad idea as well. Like that's kind of, you know, you're, you're, you can't just like pull off the band aid like that. You got to slowly adjust to, I would say, go to the range first with the shoe, play nine holes with the shoe, work your way into a position where you're more comfortable using that shoe. Then you can go ahead and, you know, play a 36 round, um, you know, long weekend with your buddies in the shoe. Yeah, when I uh, when I go to the gym, I I got in the zero shoes mm-hmm. probably two years ago. You know, when we're kind of when COVID started, you go into the gym works. Right. There's nothing else to do, or at least getting outside in our community gym. And it, it was, I I knew it was coming, but I, I could feel my feet changing as I, the more I would wear those shoes. And and then I started to wear them in the morning yep. as we go on our you know walk the dogs. And it was that's only a 15 minute walk, but for for the first couple of weeks, there was a definite change. Um, and I think one of those shoe companies, and I, there's a number of them now, they're out there. They, they had an advertisement on social media the other day where the bot, they had the bottom of somebody's foot, and then it, it was yeah. like abs. They had abs on the bottom. And it said, you know, you have to develop your yeah. the, your foot the same way you would your abs or any other muscle. Uh, but I, I, I had that idea. Um, and again, uh, Gilly and I talked about it, and Charlie and I had talked, and that's when he's 
because Gilly said, well, let's do a collaboration between the Goda and, you know, your coach and you played pro golf and then let's get the shoe guy. And that, that's when it kind of got shot down because foot joy wasn't going to invest. If the tour guys yeah. already said, no, we don't want it. But, but, but I took the zero shoes out one day. I said, let, let me just go to the range and try these. And it, it was a world of difference. It was much easier to swing. And when I got done, I didn't have uh, the soreness, not, Anything can make me sore, <laughs> right? You know, I'm so banged up, but I, I didn't have this, the same soreness. I didn't have that, you know, like I something's out of whack soreness. I had soreness from swinging, but it, it was different. So I'd recommend anybody that, that's got some minimalist shoes that to, next time you go to the range, uh, try it. You know, don't don't go play golf right away, especially if you're walking because your feet are going to be really irritated. But it, it's 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 a interesting experiment to, to go ahead and do and, and how your body just seems to work a little yeah more i mean picture yourself like you know we we have these shoes that are sensory deprivation chambers right they just kind of do the work for your foot in a sense where they support your foot they let you be lazy with the ground they let you kind of stomp your feet because you got all this cushioning and then you got these sidewalks you got everything sort of cut and, and laid out for you to where you don't got to think with your feet necessarily now we studied a lot of indigenous mm -hmm. cultures, a lot of hunter-gatherer tribes, a lot of tribes deep in the Amazon that are literally butt naked and barefoot living their day-to-day, -day, walking through woods that if you or I had to walk out there barefoot right now, we'd be like, ooh, ah. Like, we'd be Oof. like, and these dudes are just like, they're just <laughs> handling the terrain. But you'll notice that they handle the terrain much different when every step is literally slightly different because there's always some new type of – there's no, there's no sidewalks. There's like maybe light trails at best, but they are just – working their way through the literally the thick of it. But when you watch them walk, they walk with a little more purpose. They walk with a little more awareness to what's going on. You can't be lackadaisical and heavy in your heels. It hurts. You get more into that sort of thick callus of the foot, which would be the ball of the foot. And so you get a little heavier over there just naturally. You're a little more soft with your feet. You're not pounding your feet down because you're not trying to jam into a stick. Mm -hmm. You're also tuned into your environment. Your tail's back a little bit. Your crown's forward. Like, picture a Navy SEAL clearing a room. Picture the high-level operators clearing a room. They don't walk in there like you're in early extension. They don't walk in there with their tails forward and their crowns back. They walk in tail back, crown forward like you would be at a dress position, like a linebacker stands waiting for the snap, like a defender in basketball waits for the move. It's athletic position. It's tail back, crown of the head forward, balls of the feet, heels up. Like you are more in that world when you're a butt naked barefoot tribesman than let's say us who are just carousing around a mall or walking on the sidewalks with some, you know, Nike trainers on that got a big old heel and we have nothing to worry about. There's nothing that's going to jump out at you. You're just lackadaisical and you can be lazier with your system. So, you know, that's kind of like a sort of a yin and a yang look at, you know, what, what is sort of transpired from just even design of a shoe, but design of landscape and in, in what's present around us. And then you go to make that change at the foot level. And it's like, whoa, and you're, and there's a whole new awareness. There's a whole new proprioception that has to be developed um, as you're working into those shoes. So yeah, like you said, it's a, you know, slow acclimation to a stronger foot. It's not the same idea as you didn't just do one bicep curl and get Arnold's bicep. Right. That's a lot of bicep curls over time to build that muscle up. Well, it's going to be a lot of little reps over time to reorganize that foot to where that ball of the foot is strong enough to where it can hold and it can sustain all that pressure that's bottlenecking up through the system. For, for a lot of golfers, uh, because uh, back is probably the, the mm -hmm. number one issue with golfers and and. As you talked about, if if the platform or the foot isn't positioned correctly, and then the the shin, the tibia and fibula aren't working, it, it can work its way up either into the knee or, or the or the hip, and then eventually, a yep. lot of people will get into the back. As you already alluded to, it's either in a uh, something wrong mm -hmm. in, in backswing, or it's, if they compromise something in the setup to to make the backswing efficient, then they're really going to get it something on on the forward swing and the lead leg. One, as I played with Goda and and I've done a fair number of your guys' entry level exercises and and talking to Hunter and, and even though you know Noda was on a couple of weeks ago and mm -hmm. we briefly talked about Goda, one of the best things that I found and it could just be it's obviously anecdotal because I've done it and like I said I experiment with a lot of different things to see 
what helps my body. And I'll, I'll, I'll play with that for a while, but go to being one of the principal things that I do. The, the, uh, mm-hmm. the bolt rocker where, where you're just on all fours and you're going mm-hmm. forward and then leaning back to, to, to get whenever mm-hmm. my low back gets tight and I do that, it seems to be like magic. Now I think Hunter said, uh, what he prescribes to a lot of golfers is yeah. like a thousand reps if they can work up to it. And, and I mean, that, that's a lot, you know, you're sitting there rocking yeah, back right? and forth. It and feels boring. You're, after you're, a while. you're, you're grown, you're grown. Yeah. You're a grown adult. And whether doesn't matter. it doesn't matter if you're a man or yes. woman, you kind of look you like that a one goof. The privacy of your home. You <laughs> don't want to like hit that, fr- my- <laughs> hit that one on the first tee around your buddies on a golf trip. That's no, for sure. I was in the gym this morning doing that. Cause my back, yeah. low back got a little irritated and I know people cool. were looking at yeah. what the hell is this guy doing? But are there any, exercises that you see for golfers in in the system that that seem to be more prevalent or prescribed more due, due to the to low back injuries which is the the most prominent well, injury know, in golf that rocker exercise is really like one of the entry level exercises that we want to get and to give you more of a macro view as to how it maybe doesn't have to feel as funny or doesn't have to be as sort of like, dude, I hope nobody's looking at me self-conscious type thing. Cause if anybody's <laughs> listening and be like, what are they talking about? Picture when a baby is like first learning how to crawl and they get sort of into that all fours and they literally just rock their sit bones back to their heels and then they rock forward and then they rock their sit bones back to the heels. So they basically go from all fours to sit bones to heels back to all fours. And so they'll kind of rock vigorously back and forth, almost getting like a catapult type mm-hmm. of energy, back swing, down swing, back swing, down swing. And then they kind of launch into their crawl. But the juice of that, like what you're really trying to do is first and foremost, just get back to all fours. Okay. Cause getting back to all fours. Now picture this from a side view. Where is your tail in relationship to your crown? You're, it's almost like a tabletop, right? Your tail is back. Your crown is forward. Now you're seeing this image. Now imagine if I was just to kind of just move your sit bones back a little bit. You don't got to rock vigorously. Just kind of move your sit bones back a little bit. Just bend the knees. Think of like a quarter squat. If you were like to be in a kneeling position and trying to be like in an athletic kneeling position, you'd be about a quarter squat. Like the quarter squat is that magic to where you can fully open the hips and you can fully close it. That's athletic position. That's address position. That's golf. That's linebacker. Bat. You can go on mm-hmm. and you'll find that quarter squat everywhere. Well, what we're trying to do with that child rockers is first and foremost, we're trying to get that same address position. We're trying to get the tail back, get the crown forward, because what's really happening to these golfers to paint a picture for you guys is you're living in early extension. Okay. When you're sitting at the desk at work, look at where you're at. You're in early extension. Your tail is now in front of your crown. I mean, your crown is shooting back towards the back of the chair and your tail is shooting forwards to the front of the chair. That relationship is death on the golf course. Well, now you stand up and you're standing in early extension. If I was to take an image of you as you're standing about the water cooler or as you're standing watching your kids play ball, your hips are now pressed in front of, as we would say, the outer ankle bone. So when we look at people standing, we want to see the outer ankle bone the hip and the ear all stacked on a straight line. 99.99% of people that I look at their hip sits in front of their ankle bone. And now you get this weird, like ankles here, hip sits in front and then ear sits behind. So you got all this compression, just kind of funneling into the back. You're essentially standing in early extension position. So we get you to all fours because you get the tail back crown free tail back crown forward for free. It just sets you up in a nice, as we would call back chain dominant, where you dominate with the backside outside tissue, the bigger, stronger muscles, because you're a dominant forward moving species. You're like a car. You're built to go forward, but it's nice to have reverse gear every now and again. Well, we're built to go forward. Our reverse gear is the lift, is the ability to stop, put your heels in the ground, pick something up and actually literally move my legs in reverse. But that's not your default. That's not what your brain should be defaulting to. Well, we're accidentally defaulting to reverse. We're stuck in reverse. And if you were to drive on a highway 70 miles an hour in reverse, that's dangerous. So we're essentially doing that to our system by standing like that all day, resting like that all day, walking like that all day. Then you go to the golf course and your instructor's saying, stop early extending, stop early extending. You're like, I can't, I, I, what do you, I can't. Well, yeah, you don't have, you don't have the space. In. So yeah. we get you back to rockers because that allows you first and foremost, it's all about pressure. What 
is the musculoskeletal system moving? It's moving pressure. So I need to keep that pressure in the forefront of my mind as I'm reorganizing how the system's going to handle it. So when we get you to all fours, it allows you to disperse the pressure more evenly amongst the system. So when you're in a golf swing, we talked a little bit about it earlier, where the front heel would go up. Well, that's because it's really a single side move. Just like the walk is loading up one side and then releasing it over to the other. Well, your swing is no different. That pressure map is showing you that like all the pressure is going into the trail leg and then it's going out of the trail leg. So you're going to more or less be on one pivot point. You're going to take all your body weight and you're going to dump it into your trail leg and you're going to have to organize it. So you're going to be who you are at that moment. When I'm trying to rehabilitate you, I can't go to you and say, hey, get on one leg and be a goda. If you could, you wouldn't be there in front of me trying to get corrected in the first place. So what I do is I get you back down to six pivot points. I give you your hands. I give you your kneecaps. I give you the tops of your feet. Now with six pivot points, it's much easier to disperse the pressure in the system more evenly. So now when I'm in all fours, I can start to, if you're picturing all fours position, your big toes should almost be touching. So with your big toes touching and your heels away, mm -hmm. we call that upside down inside ankle bone high. What it's going to allow you to do is it's going to allow you to access the top of the ball of the foot. So the top of your foot is now on the ground, right? Well, you're still going to be active through that ball of the foot, just like I want you to be active through the ball of the foot when you're standing. So by applying pressure to the ball of the foot, that pops the arch up. If you're doing this as you're listening and you're in all fours, I guarantee you the inside of your feet are cramping because you have no arch, it's weak there, and now you're literally like popping up your shin bone and you're elevating it and you're elevating your foot and you're getting all that compression that's down at the foot level and at the shin level to start to alleviate a little bit and your muscles are like, whoa, what's this pattern? We've never done this before. But that's the conversation that you actually need to have in order to even start addressing your back problems because we've got to organize the base of the system. I've got to get you back to a tailback crown forward relationship. But I also got to honor that, hey, if you're in back pain and you've got 30, 40, 50 years of this bad pattern, I can't just throw you on one leg. That's why our system is centered mm -hmm. around taking you from all fours to a single leg progressively, step by step. And along the way, we just keep strengthening the ball of the foot. We just keep getting more access, more turns back to my shin, into my hip, into my spine, into my upper limb, into my head and neck. And along the way, I get a little more space, a little more space, a little more space. That allows the meniscus to breathe. That allows the hip capsule to breathe. It will also allow those facet joints, those cushions in between your uh, spine to start to get a little more space, start to strengthen all the muscle around it. Now you don't have as much compression. So that all fours position, just getting down to all fours, picture your, your, your second fingers pointing straight, your shoulders are over your wrists, your hips are over your knees, and then all I want you to do is get your big toes to touch, let your heels go away, apply pressure through the tops of the foot, through the ball of the foot, and then keep your eyes up and your tailbone up. Just keep your eyes up and your tail up and just kind of find out who you are right there. Then from there, just slowly start to, with the goal in mind of getting your sit bones to now work their way to the heels. So you don't got to rock vigorously to where you feel funny. Just go ahead and inch your way back slowly over time, and you're going to sort of kind of nestle your sit bones into your heels. That would be the ultimate goal in a sense as far as I want to be comfortable there. And then once I'm comfortable there with all that pressure sitting more so in the hips and the feet, now you remove two pivot points. So now you remove the hands. Now you're just on your knees and the tops of your feet. So now you've got four pivot points. Then we would work you there for a little bit. Then we would take you to standing. Now you're on two pivot points. Then we would work you there for a little bit. Then we eventually say, okay, are you ready to try one pivot point? And then we'll use a little support along the way. And that's kind of how our system goes. So to keep it safe for everybody, because there's a lot of things I could say to do, I would say get to all fours <laughs> and just reorganize yourself and then try to get to a goal where you can get your sit bones to be flush with your heel, but know that that may not happen the day, day one, just like you won't get the big bicep day one. It'll be a little bit at a time, just slowly inching your way back, and then eventually you'll be able to sit in there, and all, all along the way, you'll be, you'll be helping to build up your foot. You'll be 
loosening up all those old ankle sprains from basketball. You'll be creating a little more space <laughs> in your knee, and you'll most certainly be creating more space in your pelvis, hip, lower back area. I, I'll get the top of my foot on the ground. I've been doing it where the ball of my foot is on, and then you're the, kind of you know, close, toes yeah, not all normal. the way into the foot. Like, the yeah. ball of the foot goes from so, big so, toe I, to pinky and, toe. And I can so do it. That it, whole all the way across from big toe to pinky toe, the meat of the foot. You want all of that to be flush with the ground. Okay, so it, but it is that the top of the foot starts on the ground, and you don't have the ball with no, your you toes can, yeah, rolled under. Yeah, that's another you. variation that, that, that we add not... to it. This one would be literally one? Okay. the top skin of the foot is in contact with the ground. But if you were to, you know, if you were to x-ray through, it would be that ball of the foot area. And I'm really talking about like your, mm-hmm. your big toe knuckle to your pinky knuckle, right? Like think of if you're a, you know, bouncing up and down, you'd bounce up and down more so on the ball of your foot. You don't really bounce up and down on your heels. That's because the Achilles tendon isn't loaded through the heel. It's loaded through the ball of the foot. That's why if you want to access this spring system, if you want to access all the power that is built into the design, well, you got to access it through the ball of the foot. Otherwise, you're just compensating and you're just pulling at the way that it's been sewn. And when you pull at that, you're going to eventually tear something. You know, I, I want to get into uh, some yeah. things about training in general because uh, it, 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 your system it isn't weight oriented until yeah. you get advanced. And the golfing industry, based off what people are watching on TV and what the, the tour pros are doing, in particular in the last couple of years is we're yeah. in the distance era and they're doing a lot of weight training. You know, Bryson obviously took it to another level. Uh, as we discussed, or the, the squatting, the heavy squats and, and the deadlifts and, and they're they, at, at, at that weight, they're very detrimental. I mean, Dr. Richard Geyer was on and I asked him, I said, cause Brian Gathright wanted me to ask him. We said, ask him his opinion on squats or deadlifts. And even Doc Geyer said to put on excessive weight and do squats is not going to be beneficial for compression of the discs. Uh, you know, body squats or, or some lightweight or goblet squats, you know, okay, you know, you develop your, your glutes and your thighs. But as a traditional golfing training world or traditional training world in general, and as it, as it relates to golf, is is going more that direction. And you guys are, you, mm-hmm. you don't share that same opinion. And then you, you, you get almost, well, you know, they, they've only been around X amount of mm-hmm. years or, or they don't know what they're talking about or it's new or it, it, we, we have uh, decades of, of uh, data that show this. Can, can you just talk yeah. a little bit about that on, on, on your guys perspective on, on what golfers should be doing? And because if anyone's listened and followed you guys at all, it, you, you know that you guys are, are not anti weightlifting, but you're not into the, pushing the bars and, and putting up the big weights the way that, that some of the trainers now are, are yes. get, having their yes. golfers no, do. No, it's, or a, it's heavier. a great question because it is the status quo. It is and has been the way of training for probably since the 80s. You know, like you're talking mid-80s to late 80s, it starts to make a push and, 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 and it trickles into the pro systems and then it trickles down into uh, eventually now grade school systems and now it's 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 permeated its, all, its way all the way through to everyone's getting specialized training and, and now you add more numbers and you add this idea of strength. Well, strength is relative. You know, what's happening is these people are getting stronger at the squat and they're getting weaker at the, at the event that they're actually trying to perform, which mm-hmm. is the swing. And so the easiest way to, per, to explain the lifting engine is the lifting engine is going to pattern early extension because early extension is that hip thrusting towards the ball in the crown of your head thrusting back. Well, now picture a side view of a deadlift. Picture a side view of a back squat. When you're teaching your hips and your ankles and your feet to fire, what's really going on is you're teaching them to fire with a pattern of the hips shooting forward and the crown shooting back. Well, we all know and would all agree that in the golf swing, you actually want the opposite to happen when you fire the hip from the back swing. Mm -hmm. At the top of the back swing, when you fire your hip, where do you want your tail to go? You want it to go further back. Where do you want your crown to go? You want your crown yeah, to go make further room. forward. Why are you doing a deadlift then? Because you're now compact, you're compacting and you're compressing the system into what we would say a front chain dominant behavior where now you're dominating with the front side inside tissue and you're just collapsing, like putting on a core set backwards and you tie it in the front and you pull everything forward down and in and it suffocates your musculoskeletal system and, and, and you see all these athletes that 
they start to go heavy into the weights. They start to go heavy into the velo. They go heavy into the swing speed and they swing themselves into an injury. And yes, they get increases in velo. And yes, they get increases um, in swing speed. And the problem there is you can be explosive in a lifting pattern. You can be explosive as a WOTA. So WOTA is reverse. GOTA is drive. Just like the car, you're rooted in drive gear. That's your default operating system that comes with the phone. That's the factory settings. That's how it's built to operate. You have this nice little caveat where you can reach down to the ground and pick something up. But the reality is, if you start to think about your day-to-day, what are you picking up that's even close to maybe 30 to 50 pounds? Nothing. Really nothing, unless you're in manual labor and you're sort of forced to through the job detail. But the reality is this deadlift is only possible because you've built a bar to handle that type of weight. That's why you built the bar skinny enough to where you can grip it a certain way and you can stack a bunch of plates on it. It's all centered around more weight, more numbers. This came all from the powerlifting, Olympic lifting community where it was all about speed and explosiveness in that world. But once they finally started to take that and they started to put it into the sports world, you're going to see, if you were to chart it back, you'll see the increase in the injuries, the increase in the non-contacts, the increase in the Achilles shreds, the increase in the knee replacements. They run parallel. They run in conjunction with the increase of the lift in our training programs that we're now feeding to, as we would call them, locomotive athletes. So your golfer is a locomotive athlete. When he goes to fire his hips, when he goes to downswing, his tail has to shoot further back. But everything you do in that weight room asks him to shoot his tail towards the ball. And then you wonder why Will Zalatoris is blowing out his back when the guy's just a baby. He's just a young kid, right? You wonder why a Michelle Wee blows Mm -hmm. out the knee. Well, you're locking up her ankles on a single leg lunge. You wonder why the DJ and all these guys are, are messing up. Go watch the way they train. Their spine is up. It's upright to push forward, meaning the tail is either right underneath the ear to start the exercise, or if they do even move the tail behind the crown, it's just so they can fire the tail in front of the crown. It's literally an early extension rep. Like picture a kettlebell (laughs) swing being the absolute most ridiculous thing you could do for a golfer. It is the antithesis of what you would want in your downswing. But I see golf professionals on Twitter, other spots, grab a kettlebell and swing it to oblivion, to fix your golf swing. I'm like, what? You would literally yell at that student if they started to early extend in their downswing, but you're patterning it. And and then they'll give you some mumbo jumbo science. Pete, the reality is they ain't got any science. This is the, this is the dirty secret of this (laughs) whole world. The science speaks otherwise. The science actually says that when you take those systems and you try to run them through the gauntlet, not on young people that are, permeable that are malleable that you can change because they're going to change anyways. They're going to get strong anyways. There's this crazy plateau effect that happens where there's this early sort of muscle growth and a little bit of speed and then it crazy plateaus Mm -hmm. to where they can't get anything and then the injury sets in and then it's just career derails from there. That's the dirty secret. That's the reality of the situation is that people are lifting themselves off the freaking tour. People are lifting themselves off the T box and they're only doing it because dude, it looks cool when you put up a post about a velo going up. It looks cool when you put up a post about your swing speed, unless you're competing in that world. And even if you are, you shouldn't be doing those lifts. Cause like I already said, you're just patterning early extension. It's all this concept centered around, well, the only ways we've ever known to get strong is by a deadlift, a squat and a military press. Well, yeah, for the time being, that's been the only ways to get strong. That doesn't mean those are the only ways to get strong. You can get strong in a go to pattern. And that's what my business partner, Gary Scheffler is the expert, the only expert in the world essentially at it, which is he's developed strength and conditioning programs to simulate what you want to see in a downswing. So when you fire your hips at go to your tail stretches further back. When you fire your hips at go to you fire from the ball of your foot. So you get that Charlie Woods, young Charlie Woods look. You get that JT look in your backswing, or excuse me, in your downswing Mm -hmm. on your trail leg. He's training you to thrust the crown of your head forward as opposed to thrusting the belt buckle forward. So now when you go to the first tee box, 
all of a sudden, I haven't even had to talk to you about your swing. I don't got to talk to you about anything, but you got a subconscious behavior that is there that actually fits the task at hand, which is swinging the golf club, which if you just go back and you work your way backwards a little bit and you, you kind of take the microscope away from the table, you get into that shuttle and you go 40,000 foot view, you'll see a bigger picture playing out that we are designed for forward movement. We are not designed or rooted in reverse, much similar to a car. Unfortunately, all the training modalities, all the concepts that have been spewed and spit out by all these cadaver scientists, as we would say, who never studied pressure. They only studied isolated ranges, isolated muscles. Um, and now they're creating lifting protocols with cadaver science. It's a mess. And so they're, they're telling you bigger, stronger, faster but they're trying to hide, hide you from the fact that the injuries are increasing with this bigger, stronger, faster. You can do an explosive deadlift. You can do an explosive Olympic lift. Think backwards movement. High jump is literally a reverse gear. Notice how the crown of the head leads over the bar first. Mm -hmm. The tail shoots forward. They literally jump up and backwards. Picture a backflip. Picture how it's just a throwing of the hips forward. The crown shoots backward. We do have a reverse gear. And we are explosive beings, so we can be explosive in reverse gear. So you can find short-term explosion in your WOTA pattern, but you will not find long-term durability in that WOTA pattern. Whereas if you are an athlete or a weekend golfer, whoever you are, if you orient your mind first and foremost to durability and you start to correct the durability in your system, you will get the strength for free because you can be explosive as a Gota. You can have all those same things. You can have all the aesthetics. You can have all the strength. You can have all the speed, but you can also be on the tee box more often. The more often I can get you on the tee box, the more often I can limit the pain in the system, the more I can increase the performance. Because at the end of the day, the thing that makes you better is the thing that you're trying to do. You're not getting better in that weight room. You're getting better on the tee box. You're getting better in the competitions. And what's happening is people are spending more and more time in this training world and less and less time on the craft. And then they're getting broken down through the training and they're not getting as much time to play on the, on the tour. And then what's happening is you're seeing these, these dips. People aren't able to go on a run. They get a couple run and then pff, injury. They come back, get a couple run pff, injury. Mm -hmm. And these dudes are freak athletes. They're super gifted. They're great at the game. They got the mind for it. But if we just would get out of the way a little bit and let these guys be more natural and let them actually do what is the sport, let them do what is the behavior, dude, you would see a whole different tour out there. You'd have way more, you'd have more healthy golfers. And if the golfers are doing it, then the regular people are going to start to do it. And you won't have to skip your boys trip because your back is spasming you'll be able to go and have and enjoy yourself. What, what are some of the exercises that, that you guys prescribe for golfers that, that, that would in it, that either do mm -hmm. or don't, don't involve weights. Like, you know, so if somebody's a diehard, you know, they grew yeah. up in that eighties era where, where that was kind of the, the inception sure. of, of utilizing more weight training in the sport. And let's say that, I mean, that's just put, that's been developed in their DNA for 30 years and they, they want to do some weight training. What, what are some of the, the, the exercises that that you guys have that, that would involve yeah, that's a great moving question. some so weight like around. Three of them off the bat that are kind of what we, I would say are big ticket items is one, a sled push or a sled pull, right? So now because of the sled push or the sled pull, picture yourself, picture side view of where you would be as you are pushing and as you are driving the hip for that sled. Where is the tail to the crown? The tail gets to stay back. The mm -hmm. crown gets to stay forward. Now, there obviously you need to be, have proper cueing and those types of things, but more or less you're creating that same alignment that you want to see at a dress, that you want to see stay during the backswing, that you certainly want to see during the downswing. It's the same thing we talked about in all fours. Well, now we're just taking it to a little more pressure in the system, a little more resistance. So sled pushes and sled pulls we use often. We also use a weight vest quite a bit, or we use a plate that will squeeze to the chest. So that allows us to load the system in a way that isn't just this one single bar, like a yoke, just pressing down on the spine. It lets us more disperse the pressure down, yeah. amongst the torso. And then because you're wearing it like a t-shirt, it flows with you like a t-shirt. So now you're not arresting 
And think of what you're doing when you put a bar in your back. You're arresting the facet joints of the spine, which it's not designed that way. It's built off of Friette's laws, Friette's second law is built off of God's laws, but it's built to work a very specific way, spinal engine theory. It's been talked about in the golf world, and um, they get it in the sense that, well, you got to move your spine. Your chest points out to the trail leg, and then it points over to the front leg. So it has to move. You can't hold it straight. Mm -hmm. But you're putting that bar on your back. You're stopping your torso. You're stopping your upper limb. You're, you're arresting your ability to move. Well, the weight vest is a great addition to a lot of what would be looked at as body weight exercises, but now they're leveled up. Now you're putting load on the system. Another thing that we'll use is a landmine. So picture that barbell and how when it's flat and it's in a traditional sense, it's limiting. It locks up a spinal engine. It locks up a, a, a multi-planar, um, you know, spiral staircase type movement. Well, now we take the barbell and we place it on its head. So a landmine is basically taking a barbell, placing it on its head. Well, now it pivots. Yeah. So now you can do more with it to stay in that pattern. You can help yourself by using a landmine because it lets you keep the tail back. It lets you keep the crown forward throughout the exercise. The next thing we'll do is we call it, it's called a henny press. It was made famous by um, a former NFL fullback. And what he did was basically took the TR, TRX bands and then put a barbell through the TRX mm -hmm. bands. So like a sled push, more or less, you're not hanging on. The barbell's not hanging on you. It's hanging on the TRX band. So now you can step into the rack and you can almost more or less push it. So you can kind of push the, 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 the bar out in front of you and it allows you to still kind of, you know, turn the bar a little bit and you can get that spine to move. So we use those three or four concepts probably um, the most when it comes to as we would say, we don't want to lift weight. We want to move the weight. So by moving the weight, that allows us to keep the tail back, keep the crown forward as we're firing our hips and our ankles, our spine, and our upper limb. And then, like I said, one of the greatest little additions there, that fourth concept is the weight vest. So once we take that athlete from all fours, we start to get them stronger. We use the wall. We'll use some support concepts to help them find positioning. But then eventually, we want to get them to two legs or one leg with no support, two legs, one leg, no support, all the pressure in one column, just like it's going to have to be when you're at that T box. And then once we get them to kind of find where they're at, well, now it's like, all right, you want to heat this thing up, throw a weight vest on. Now you got this extra weight on, you're getting that load. We can still give you all those same things because that's really what you're, what you're chasing. Unless you just love lifting and you're a power lifter by trade, more or, le more or less, when I actually peel back people's goals, they don't love the lift. They just know it to be the only way to get the workout that they associate with that high. You can still get the cardio high. You can still get the muscle pump. You can still get the muscular endurance and the fatigue and the, and the, and the mental fatigue of pushing yourself. None of that is relegated or only sort of allowed in a power lift, Olympic lift derivative. Those are just general concepts of how you set up your reps, your sets, and your rest. What we do in between as the workout, that can change. So we still get, like if you were down in Gary's gym, he's got top-level athletes from, from grade school studs that are top in the country to literal NFL stars, and these dudes are getting work. And, and it's happening with very minimal weight even needed. In fact, we often joke, we'll be cooking them in just a basic standing position because the second you try to get into the ball of your foot and lift your heel up, you realize how weak you are. So once we start getting them in those positions, we'll be always joking. Hey, you guys want some weight? And they're all like, no, there's no way I want to add any weight, right? <laughs> like once you realize what it's like to be in that ball of foot, man, you're just walking around heavy in the ball of the foot, light in the heel, and you can feel like, oh, that's where I want to be on the backswing. That's where I want to be on the downswing. And then you're not creating this magnetic through the heel scenario. You're in this spring system. Think about that jump rope concept, that bouncing concept. Think of the springiness, the athleticness, the athletic potential that is there through the ball of the foot. You're bouncing up and down the ball of foot. Now try to bounce up and down on your heel. It's death. It's just bone on bone. There's no real sort of spring to that movement. Well, why are you training like that? You want to really be able to move on the balls of your feet to be a true athlete, but you got to go ahead and train that way to be able to do that when you're at the tee box. 
the, the, the one person who, who I know has, has done, and you brought up landmines, which is interesting because mm -hmm. I think that it's a very good exercise. And uh, I had Fast Eddie Fernandez on last month. And Eddie's number one in the senior long drive, and he's number 14, I believe, in the world at 52 or three years old. And and if you look at, I mean, Eddie, he, he he's a he's a big and he's a strong guy, but he's not bulky. And here's a guy that's 53, I think, and he's swinging 100, 140 mm -hmm. miles an hour. It looks like he's cruising, but like he's on the you know, like he's on the second hole, just kind of going to hit it for accuracy. And, and you know, he shows the the speed, and it's at one. 40, but I believe one of his exercises was where he does the landmine press where he'll squat down and he'll have it on one shoulder and he'll press as he comes up, fires, he presses overhead and he goes to the other side and it goes back and forth. And as you said, you, and I, I really like the, the weight yeah. test if somebody wants it because you're working them in a dynamic position that's going to translate into the, the golf game and them holding weight yep. on whether it's two legs, one leg at a time, and then shifting back the other one. That, that's a very cool one. I had not thought about using a weight vest in that, that way. Even though I've seen some, <laughs> I've seen the videos of, of you guys in the gym and, and some of the kids in there where they're, they're in the, the, the get ready yep. position, but they're up on the balls of their feet. And they, I mean, they're, they're just sitting there and they're shaking. Difficult. Some of them, yeah. yeah, some of them have 45 pound weight. And it's like, <laughs> that, that's what we're trying to get to is that like, you're, you're not getting stronger in your swing. Like that's the crazy part that these guys don't understand is like, you're actually taking away from the nuts and bolts of your swing. You're getting stronger in the lift. Like, dude, you can pack muscle on a multitude of ways. Like bodybuilders are packing muscle on, and none of that has anything to do with being athletic. Well, the same thing is kind of happening to a powerlifting, mm -hmm. Olympic lifting derivative. You're getting good at powerlifting and Olympic lifting. If you're a powerlifter or an Olympic lifter, yeah, you got to do those things. That's what you do. It's your sport. You're a golfer. You're not a lifter. They're, they're two completely different patterns. Just go watch it play out. Like I said, you all know that in your downswing, you want your tail to go further back from a dress. Okay, then why would you ever do lifting? Lifting takes your tail underneath to in front of your crown. It's, it is the early extension. It is the air that you're trying to avoid. Just off that evidence alone, because if you are going to use a slow motion video in your swing, why aren't you using it in the weight room, right? Like don't, the eye in the sky never lies, right? Like, right. I try to get this across to golf coaches and it's just like, mm -hmm. dude, it strikes an ego with them. Look, we all did it. I was teaching Olympic lifts in 2015 to high school kids. It wasn't until Gilly showed me and I was like, oh man, like this explains it all. We're all training with our heels down. We're telling our brain what to do. And then we go out to the field and we try to put more pressure and we add a reaction into it. And yeah, of course the, the knee explodes because the ankle's locked up. Of course the Achilles explodes. The shin and the foot are on, on, not on the same page. So it's like you got to look at patterns, you know, and golfers are probably more – should be able to see this quicker because you, you guys are already tuned to patterns. You're already tuned to cycles and rhythms and pressure and weight transfer. Like it should be easier for the golf world, which I think it has been in a large – if you were to look at it big picture, I'd say more golfers are like, dude, I like what you guys are saying because they already agree with the concepts of turning, the concepts of spiraling. Right. It's hard sometimes mm -hmm. with, you know, track coaches are, are taught like linear pistons. You know, football coaches are taught linear pistons. So you bring a spiral to that. They're like, what? Whereas golf is more accepting of that concept. So I think if you were to, if you, if you can frame it in your mind from that early extension error, because I know you guys have all seen that because you're all battling it. Now look at your deadlift from mm -hmm. the side view. Why are you doing that? Why are you thrusting? Why are you teaching your hip to fire as you thrust your tail forward? So, like I said, there's still ways to get that workout in. There's still ways to level up your muscular endurance. There's still ways to get your aesthetics and to be explosive. You're just going to be durable in the same at the, at the same time. You're going to be training really for durability and then getting the other stuff for free. I, I was kind of lucky in that way. And that, as we talked about earlier, I don't have any limited at, at best dorsiflexion in my ankles. So for, for I have modified, well, I'll do a, a goblet squat. Mm -hmm. I'll only hold a 50 pound dumbbell. But when I do it, I've got the Olympic weightlifting shoes on and I have a 10 pound plate on the mm -hmm. ground. So my heels are really lifted mm -hmm. while, while I'm doing the exercise. And for, for me, that just seems to work because if, if I, there's no way I can do a flat foot. I did try to do a very wide stance squat at one time, just, just, uh, body weight and then holding, yeah. holding the, the rings, uh, that, that, what are they called? The, uh, you know what I'm talking about? But I, within 
two and a half weeks, I got, I had the worst plantar fascia in my life because yeah. as I was so wide, my feet started collapsing in and no one, everyone's like, how the hell did you get plantar fascia from doing squats? I, I don't know, but I quit yeah. the squats yeah. and it, it went away. Yeah. It was, it's like magic. But now I do it with, you know, my, my feet will be straight. I'll, I'll have uh, when I go down, I make sure the knee yep. ro- you know, the shin rotates out and the knee goes out, but having that heel up maybe by default that I couldn't do it the other way. Um, but I, and I, I don't, yeah. I mean, that's heavy for that me. Is to probably, that's pounds, more of a heavy. I just do that. To have it, the other part of it is like, like I said, we have a system in place because we, we, I got to get some space back into the system first. Like we'll do a lot of that all fours type of training because I kind of need to break or paper clip, you know, the way you'd break a paper clip or you kind of wiggle back and forth. There has to be a little bit of that concept mm-hmm. playing out before we just max load this thing. So I got to kind of break the foot up a little bit, break the ankle up a little bit, get that joystick a little more movement inside the platform, get that platform to start to organize and, and kind of reawaken some of the muscles. Then we tuck our toes. We work a little bit the tuck toe. Then we push back into the bolt position, the low squat, resting squat position. Then we stand up. And it's like that's how we would generally take people through the system so that they can kind of work their way up to where once they're standing, it's like, oh, if I wanted to gently light my he- let, let my heel get down and sit into a resting squat, we wouldn't load that. But like that's an actual resting position in the human system. Um, we could have access. We should have access. Now, when you want to load your squat, like you're saying with a goblet, yes, get your heel up. So like I said, whenever you're really loading for explosive mm-hmm. power, you want to be loading through the ball of the foot. And we sell these little devices that are – we call them the go to chucks and it's basically like a door wedge that is set up on a slant, just like that roof type slant that we talked about earlier where it's funneling outside and we treat them almost like the game of Jenga where if I were to move that block out from underneath your heel, your heel wouldn't collapse. So we actually use the blocks as more of like proprioception awareness tool to where I'm going to actually hover my heel just over the block. If my heel touches during the training, I get that little quick feedback to lift my heel up again. So it's a nice little tactile feedback tool to have in your back pocket. It's easy to transport, and you can set that thing up fist with distance. They're super mobile friendly as far as taking them where you need to take them. And then you can start to do your goblet squats. You can drive down through the ball of your foot and up through your heel. And then you can start to, once again, get that tail, drive the tail back, drive the crown forward. Then you're just doing light little squats, Mm -hmm. just quarter range squats, just kind of opening up the shin, opening up the shin, opening up the shin, opening up the thigh and getting that space to get back into the system and then building strength inside of it. It's a, the goblet squat is the way we do it heals up. It's so underrated because you can really hammer those out. You can get a lot of good reps in and it builds up that backside tissue. And we find that people have a lot of relief at the knee level and at the lower back level when they get good at that exercise. Yeah, and it, it it does seem to work like yeah, the VMO a lot more. Yeah, let the inside get back to where uh, it should the front part be. Of like the front thigh. side and backside should be in harmony yes, with and, each other. You're just dominant with the backside, but your front side still has to play, still has to work. It, it, it as I as I've watched Goda for roughly five to six years, uh, from, from <clears> first from afar, and then as, mm-hmm. as we talked, I've had Gilly on and Hunter, and now you, and and in I mean it it. Uh, it attracts people like you and I who had searched for some answers that, that we couldn't find them or we found bits and pieces and it really wasn't working. So you get a fair amount of people like that, but it also draws a, so I would say some of the, the younger group are very passionate uh, about it. And, and it hasn't, it, it has changed over time, but in the earlier days, and I would say up until a couple of years ago, and you would watch these almost arguments on online and, and and you guys, un, uh, unfairly to me, as, as I met a number of mm-hmm. you, ca- kind of got a bad rap that that go to you know that, that they're yeah. just pushing to, to be dogmatic. Um, and I even think when you guys you're, you're, you've been on Mark Bell's a couple times, which is where I've, I've watched you guys both of them. And uh, Nassim wasn't. Yeah. Uh, I think he had COVID the first time, and 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 he he kind of gave a re- recap to like you know it seems like it's a really good thing, but you can't knock other systems. But you, your guys' mm-hmm. messaging has has changed. 
over the last few, number of years. And when you were on again, you know, he, he was there and Mark was in the, in, and the, their editing guy was there. And it really seemed like a different conversation than many years ago. Has that been a concentrated effort or was it before you kind of had, you were the new guys on the block and everybody's trying to knock you down and it was, hey, we got to defend our position. And now that you're somewhat, a, a, you're not the establishment, but you're established as a legitimate practice. Does, does the, is the messaging seems to have changed? It, it, am I somewhat right on that, or was that a uh, concentrated? Say, hey, you know, we, we don't need to 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 be portrayed as this. We're a lot better than that. Our system's better than that. We need to, uh, to show people that. So, w w was that a conscious yeah, decision, no, or, or did it just evolve? On, like when it was just Gilly and Gary kind of going around, and they, they had a chance to kind of talk about this this, you know, system, um, while it was really truly still in its infancy com compared to what we've built it to be today, as far as, you know, um, much easier to work your way through much easier to kind of conceptualize. But in those early days, like they tried the kind of the nice approach to things and they got laughed at and they got kind of pushed to the side. They weren't even like given a chance. And then I think there was a, a switch to be a little bit more like, oh yeah, well look at this, look at all these ACL shreds. And there was a little bit of a push there. And at times maybe we pushed too far. And then you start to realize that you're kind of pushing on what people love, what people have attached their ego to. And the other reality is that mm -hmm. maybe they just don't know. And sometimes when you lead in with that as your starting point, you're going to get people to go, whoa, whoa, who the, who the heck's this guy? And they kind of seize up and they're not even going to hear what you have to say. So yes, we have definitely tried to make a more conscious effort to, I would say, just talk about what's good. Talk about what makes something durable. Talk about these these behaviors of inner ankle bone high and show them and show how they look good and, and show without necessarily picking apart a deadlift, there's still a ton of other ways to show that, Hey, a collapsed foot isn't a good idea. Our arch is meant to collapse. Well, no. Okay. Well, why are you collapsing your foot? Like there's a lot of different narratives that we could work to convey the same message. I think we made the, or came to the conclusion after enough fighting that this isn't going to be one fell swoop, a clean rip of the Band-Aid. It's just not going to happen that way. The status quo, mm -hmm. the, the establishment is too far entrenched. And, and I think that even if, you know, Gary was, to be honest, or um, it wasn't a clean rip for, of the Band-Aid for him. I think he needed to be around. He had the benefit of having Gilly in the building, in his back pocket, allowing him some time to kind of let this concept wash over his eyes and over his brain and let it slowly come to him and it wasn't really until Jamar Chase came down with the ball in the back of the end zone his senior year and beat up his knee that, that Gary like really took a look at it. So it sometimes takes an injury to push somebody, either an athlete or a coach, to a point where they go, hey, let me take another look at this. Because we've had tons of coaches that have stood up in front of us at our lab weekends and said, I wholeheartedly believe in what you guys are doing. I wholeheartedly believe in this concept. But I'm going to be honest with you. The first time I saw it, I said, these guys are full of shit. So it's like there is that, you know, and it's funny. We laugh <laughs> about it. And we have to realize that I think what will more or less happen is you'll get to a point where, and I've seen this now, where the, our biggest opponents and people that were laughing at us, they're now adding our stuff into their programs. So now you're going to eventually get to a 50-50 where it's like, yeah, we're still, they're going to still try to hold on to the old world because, well, their whole ego, their whole you know, their education, it's a lot of projection too, because they'll say dogmatic, but they're dogmatic about what they do. So it's a lot of projection. Whereas uh, Gilly didn't create shit. This is just, uh, this is observed. Nothing here is created. This is only things that I'm going to show you in cross reference with slow motion video or with how the body is literally designed by some of the great anatomists like a Philip Beach who wrote Muscles and Meridians. We're still looking at that side of things we're still taking into account science. In fact, I feel like we're the only ones that are truly doing science because we're actually observing nature. We're observing the way things are. And so we're only pointing back to what's been observed, not just what's been felt or what's been thought to be correct or what's been in a lab. But I think you'll get to a 50-50. Then you'll see a 60-40. Then you'll see a 70-30, an 80-20. And I think that'll probably be the more realistic exchange of Big picture, it will be less and less weights, less and less one rep max, and more and more movement-based exercises, movement-based practices, longevity-based practices. But it will come off the backs of, unfortunately, 
thousands and thousands of injuries. You're seeing it now in the golf world, in the baseball world, in the basketball world, in the football world. In basketball, it's called load management. In golf, you're like, man, why is a, how does a Will Zalatoris, why is everyone's knee being beat up? Why are backs hurting, right? In baseball, you're seeing elbows blow out. You're seeing front hips explode. In the football world, it's the turf, right? There, it's this, it's this as the problem. It's the, the ACLs and the Achilles keep rising. So the, the injuries, they're not going to go away and they're going to keep knocking on the door. And since they'll always be at the front of the door and they'll always be pushing, that will be part of what switches the narrative. And then once people start to truly look at the injury, they're going to see what we've seen. And the problem with the situation for them is, if you try to disprove Goda, you only prove it to yourself, right? That it's true. That's what's happened to a lot of people is that when they try to prove it wrong, they red pill themselves, as I would say. Like I've had that happen so many times. <laughs> and that's why I play it more like Leonardo DiCaprio in Inception, where he goes in, he plants the idea deep into their mind, and he lets them come to the realization over time. And that's how I try to play it now. When I talk to people, I know that I'm maybe not going to win that day, but I also know that nothing I've told them is created. It's only observed. And so whether they know it or not, they've been looking at Goda and Woda their whole lives. They've been observing movement patterns their whole lives. They've been, if I, I tell them this, I go, think about how your dad walks. Why can you picture how your dad walks? What is that? Well, we biomimic. So we mimic those in front of us because it lets us learn quicker. So we already have mm -hmm. pattern recognition built into our system. I'm just now showing you that it's a binary system that works off of zeros and ones, pluses and minuses, goods and bads. So now once I just got to slide that across the table and show you those images, I'll let you figure it out for yourself. So we've more or less kind of done it that way and just kind of show good, show bad. You can show good and show bad without necessarily attaching it to a lift or attaching it to an exercise or to a modality. Because when you do that, you start to push on egos, you start to push on educations. And if you're doing that, you're going to seize up that person's ability to open up to new information, which we realize that's counterproductive. I'd rather a gym be 50-50 go to WOTA than 100 WOTA zero go to, right? So let's start there. If that's where we mm -hmm. got to start to get the conversation going, Let's go there, and I'll let you guys figure it out as we roll. So, yeah, it has been a con concerted effort on our parts, but I do think that at the beginning it was good to make a little noise and bang the drum a little bit because it kind of made people look around and go, what the hell are these guys talking about? And then once we got your attention and we got the microphone, now we can calmly express what we say. And it's like I, I mess around with these trolls every now and again when I got time, and I'll be like, man, you guys are saying the same things you said two years ago. Like, where will you be year five, year 10? Like, at what point do you realize, like, it's not going away? It's not created. It's just observed. Yeah, it, it, if it wasn't it legit, it, it, it wouldn't have got to the level that it is at now. And, and, and the thing I've learned, as we talked about earlier about the podcast, is that, that there that there are certain things, and everything is individualistic. And it's not, you know, yes. this didn't just show up. It, it's been there. And it just hasn't been incorporated. So... Are there aspects of the weight mm -hmm. training world that can be utilized? I'm sure there are. Um, and I, I, I mean, I'd love to talk to Gary about, you know, using and only using the one rep max as a form of measurement to determine what, let's say, a 50% load would be mm -hmm. to, to, as he's designing programs. So, okay, if you're doing 50% load, it sets a 15 or it reps a 15. You can figure that out. And if you're not able to get that, is the weight too strong or, or you just have, sure. do you have a strength problem or do you have an endurance problem? So to figure that, things like that out. So, Th those things are adaptable, but it's like, why not utilize this? Because an individual, t take myself, who, who has gone down the traditional path. I mean, I used to sit there and yeah. kneel on a ball and do my entire workout, presses, curls, mm -hmm. try. I mean, I, it, but I still had back issues. And it's like, okay, so, something in the traditional sense isn't working. So I, I guess I was more open to it because I had gone down that path. And it, I still, the result was I still had uh, nagging injuries and, and it wasn't, for as much time as I put in, I wasn't getting the result that and, everyone, including yeah. myself, thought I should. So right. for me, it was easier to see Goda and say, yeah. wait a second, there's yeah. something here. I don't know what it is, so I'm going to take another step to find out. And I think if more people did that, but I think you yeah. guys are getting to that point if you haven't gotten to it already, oh, yeah. to where there's some legitimate oh, yeah. people that, that are paying that, attention. Your story, 
is echoed. And I see it every single day. Like you're an open-minded athlete trying to get better. And the open-minded athlete trying to get better, that's where I came from. I don't care what the truth is. I don't care how uncomfortable it is. I want it. I love constructive criticism. Like I Mm -hmm. want to know what I'm doing bad. Like I said, I want to get to the source. I want to know the problem. I will own my mistakes. The, the, what we're seeing with a lot of athletes is they're having that moment where they're like, dude, I check every box in the weight room. I'm a stud. Why did I miss eight games for knee pain? Why? Like we've, we're literally having mm-hmm. professional athletes, pro bowl athletes come in and go, I'm checking every box. I'm about to be due for a big contract. I can't stay on the field. Like I, I, they're almost out of desperation. Now it's like goat has been put into different corners and been spoken on through so many different people that we got athletes. They're like, well, after I heard your name for the fifth time, I figured I might go check it out. You know, it's like one of those situations or they see a message come across the timeline and they're like, yeah, you know what? I can squat 600 pounds, but I can't play 17 games, right? Like that doesn't make any sense to them. They're starting to, because now they at least have a group of people that are, that are asking or sort of pointing to that question that they've been having in the silence of their own mind. These people are thinking about this. I know they are because they're looking at it. It's like, does Saquon Barkley have weak quads? Like this is the irony of this situation is that they'll tell you if you tear your knee, you got weak quads. But in the same regard, they'll tell you that Saquon Barkley has the biggest quads. Well, then how did he tear his knee? Which one is it? Like they're getting caught up in a Mm -hmm. lot of their narratives are just, they're slipping through the cracks one after another. And we just keep We've been, if you look at our Instagram lately, we're just hitting you with fact, hitting you with fact, giving you little wins, giving you little victories. Go look at it. You'll learn something every single day. That's our goal that Gary and I have in mind. Let's give these people a victory every single day. Let's give them something to learn. Let's show them Gota and Woda. Let's show them the differences in the system. Like we've got the system so organized from a step-by-step standpoint to where it was in 2019. Like early 2019, people would come in. We had it on Slack. In Google Drive, it was disorganized. There wasn't really clean video. There wasn't chronological step-by-step. We opened the door to a lot of coaches. And this is full ownership. I take extreme accountability on it. We opened the doors for coaches to try to go search for answers elsewhere. And so they're trying to learn from Instagram, where everybody's an expert, where the reality is the, the, it needs to be, <laughs> it shouldn't be difficult. It should be simplified. It should be chronologically organized, like a table of contents, Boom, 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 boom. And as you go down this table of contents, you're just getting your coach's eye just clean, clean, clean. And by the time you're done with it, you're like, dude, I'm ready to help my dad. I'm ready to help myself. I'm ready to help this young golfer that's got back pain. And now we've got it to where coaches are are getting through the system in two weeks time, three weeks time, within two to three months, they're now getting people recoded or changing their foot level behavior in their sprint in six to 12 days. So we're now, what was taking six to 12 months, we're now able to dust up and clean up and brush up and take through a fine tooth, take a fine tooth comb to it, to where if you're not wasting your time and you're getting directly to the source, you can get cleaner results faster. So now that's what our whole goal is. It's like, dude, we could sit here on comment sections and bullshit with these people all day. Or why don't you just show it? Just show it. You know, it's like extreme ownership. Just show these people that you can fix Mm -hmm. movement behavior. You know, show them that you can take somebody's crooked foot, inner ankle bone low and straighten it and pop the inner ankle bone high. Because if after that point, what are they going to say? So that's been our focus is like, let's build a badass system that's got a simple, easy to uh, um, follow and easy to kind of understand concepts so that any person, coach, parent, or athlete can go through that and say, damn, dude, I know the body. I have a better understanding of how this thing works. Now let's go start to take control of my own And then let's start to help people around me in my community. And so as we shifted focus there, I think naturally we got less and less on the comment sections in more and more in content creation, more and more in like, what's a clean narrative? What's a good cue? Like, dude, we just spent the last week and we're like, how do we get people to find the ball, their foot better? We're playing around with cues and we're trying them out in the gym. And as you know, feel isn't always real. Sometimes what you're saying doesn't relate, Mm -hmm. but there are often times where you might find a a success rate of 80% with a certain cue. So certain things do tend to get stuck into the world and they do 
get pushed on people, and they are good cues. One of the things we've been telling people, hey, drive down through the ball of the foot and up through the heel. Well, it's getting a better response. So people are more active with their foot. They're finding that foot structure quicker. If they find that foot structure quicker and they can get that, all I got to get you to find is the kinesthetic feel one time. That's what that great golf coach is searching for. Like, if I can get this kid to find that kinesthetic feel the one time, then it's just a rep game. Now let's just rep it out. And now I just keep going back to that feel. So feel is real once it corresponds with matching tape. So that's kind of the difference is match the tape yeah. to the feel. Now you're cooking with fire, baby. Now we can actually go and we can rep this thing out. That's what we've tried to do. And when we've done that, we've sort of grabbed the narratives back and we've just overall opened the doors to more people to, to learn quicker and to give this thing a second chance, if you will, and be like, you know what? I guess it does kind of make sense. Yeah, the, the, the one good thing about the Internet is no matter how smart somebody is or expertise in their field, th that the Internet has, has shown to everybody that th yeah, there's right. always someone that might know something else. And and so so if you have a, a an expert and and I, I'm a fan of his I, I just listened to him on Huberman okay. Lab, uh, Andy Galpin Dr Andy Galpin he's obviously exceptional at what he does I, he he's got oh, he's at the is it Cal State or Fuller I can't remember what what school he's at but he's he's one of the the the, the top trainers in, in the country um but it, it look I'm just using his example if he sees go to online whereas someone in his position before might have said yeah that's bullshit. In today's world of internet, and hey, there's people doing some great stuff all over the place, and now the internet has allowed it to be shown, like like you guys have. I I, I think that someone at his level who who has already experienced that, I'm sure he got shot down by right. somebody smarter than him as, as he was coming up. That that he would say, hey, this go to I've heard it more than once. Let me go. Let me call uh, Gary. Or let me call Ricky and, and sure. talk to them because I, I want to know a little bit more about it because it can. It's only going to make me better, or I can pick and choose what I think will help my athletes and so on. So what I'm getting at is, if, if you went back to the to, to the to the guys who were getting educated in the 80s and 90s, who came up in the traditional, they went to college, got a strength conditioning degree, and then all of a sudden here, here came all of the uh, holistic stuff. And they're like, hey, let me check this out because right. I'm not getting the answers that I want to for my own health or for my own training. And th then they went down that path. We're now in today's world. You've got all these different types of things. And I think that the next wave of, of kids coming up were maybe coming out of school now and they get out with a strength and conditioning degree. And now they've got GOTA, they've got traditional, right. they've got foundation, they've got Eldoa, they've got check institute, they, all these things that they can go learn from. They can. You guys all have classes and it's online. I think this next wave of people who, the physical fitness industry and, and, and any golf coaching as well. Uh, that, that, that next group of instructors or coaches or whatever you want to call them is really going to be very impressive and what they can do. It's going to be very, well, we might not be around to see the result because as they get to our age, you know, their athletes, their training, we're going to be a hell of a lot older, but I guess we'll get to watch it on TV. It's going to be very interesting to watch what happens to athletes mm -hmm. when they have this amalgam of information. And then not only that, but, which one to put in, which piece that the right. athlete needs at a particular point in time so that they can catch that, you know, wave and shoot them up. And then maybe the next time, maybe they need a little, little less of that, but a little more of something else. I think that's the mastery of of uh, the, the, that next group or, or someone who's going to be exceptional. It, it, the, the, the era of the fighting uh, go to bullshit. It, it, you know, it hasn't proven itself over 60 years. For I think sure. that era it was something is we kind of had to go through, view, but it is definitely in the rear and, view. And, 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 yeah, and and, sure. and and you can take goat out, and you can put something else in there. Um, I know I went through that when when I got back when I got done playing back into coaching because the guy I worked with for club fitting, he he was arguably the best in the country, and and I got to watch him after I worked with him for a while. You know, we would sit, he would mostly sit there, but I I learned how to do it mm -hmm. and learned how to pick up the same way you do with Gary and, and Gilly. Uh, you do it with you, you're on them long enough, you you start to see the things that other people aren't seeing, and. and instead of arguing with somebody who had been trained in the traditional like lie boards and you got to do face tape to see what your length is. It's like, well, mm -hmm, that's, mm -hmm. that's not science. That's bullshit. And, and he, he, here's what you need. And they said, well, no, I, I went to X company and they fit me for this. And I like, well, do you hit this club this way? And this yeah. one, this way, I'm like, how do you know that? You've never seen me play golf. Yes, it's like, well, I've recognition. seen this pattern. It, it, you guys, you, I, I've seen this pattern recognition hundreds of times for me, a hundred for, for Mike, it was thousands and thousands of times. It's like, 
okay, he, he, here's what we're going to do. And, and you, the look on their face when you change, me in the golf world, you, you in the training world, and, and they do mm -hmm. a movement and they no longer have that pain. And they look at you like, yeah, we used to call it the big like the, O. The o face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. they're like, like the, the light yeah. bulb. Oh, my off. God. <laughs> and for some people, that's a longer period of time, yeah. a longer exposure period of something to where it finally clicks for them. Um, we would always use the analogy of like emptying the cup. We have people that show up. There are some of these instructors that they might be world renowned, but they walk around with an empty cup. There's other people that they can't put, find three clients in their cups full of preconceived notions. Those people that have an empty <laughs> cup, right. they have that, they have all that success because they're walking around looking for truth. And I think the, the crazy part is, is I think people look at us at Gota as people with a full cup. But the reality is we were all people walking around with an empty cup looking for truth. Do you think we haven't done the Olympic lifting? you think we haven't done this stuff? I lived it. I've been doing it since eighth grade. Gary's been training it since he started his gym. Like we've done these systems. We've tested these systems. We've gone that route. That's how we know it doesn't work, you know? And then it's like that athlete who's looking for answers. I just so happen to have the perfect storm of things. I, I was an athlete. I was able to test a bunch of different methods as I was going through my, 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 my professional career. I was able to go, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. I didn't have any financial gain from these concepts. I was literally just trying to, I was on the cut line. I was trying to stay on, on, in a locker room. So if it didn't work, see you later. And nothing mm -hmm. worked. And then it wasn't until, and everybody would always tell me what to do, tell me what to do, tell me what to do. And it was, why? Well, because I said so. And it wasn't until Gilly, and Gilly was the first one, hey, you might want to take a look at this. You might want to take a look at this. And he pointed me to something instead of just pointing a finger to do this. He said, go look at that. Go tell me what you think. So I did what he said. I tried to prove him wrong on the ACL shreds or the Achilles shreds. I tried to go find one. That was in this bow pattern. He exposed me to this bow concept of inner ankle bone high. I tried to go find it. It didn't exist. So I essentially red pilled myself one night. I went to spend a night. I already knew what the lift looked like. Looked like I'd been doing it my whole life. I knew it was heels down. I knew it was drive through the heels. I knew it was crooked foot. I knew all those things. He said, go watch some ACL shreds. I spent a night looking at ACL shreds and I had the O face. I was like, oh my goodness. I remember sitting there. I remember... DMing him back. I'm like, dude, y'all got it. I'm like, this is, this is it. Cause I had, I had already seen my buddies tear their ACLs. I had already seen the ACL t tear go rampant through locker rooms year after year. Like I had already seen how we trained. It was like, I already had mm -hmm. all these, I'd spent eight years studying movement. I had all these red dots on the, like, this kind of seems important. That kind of seems like it's bullshit. And then Gilly showed me the iPad and he showed me the slow motion video of the ACL tear and of the bow. And that was the moment where it was like, get the string out. And I was able just to start stringing it all together. And I was like, oh my gosh, like there it is. And now it's not a case of what this man said. It's what is observable? What is repeatable? What is a pattern recognition that I don't care how many times I go look at it, I can't prove it wrong. And so it's like, that was the moment where for me, it was like, wow. And I think people look at, what we just uncovered a binary system. Look, nature is binary. I don't care what you say. It's male, female, it's, it's zeros, ones, it's plus minuses. It is what it is. You can cry about it all you want. It's inside ankle bone high and it's inside ankle bone low. <laughs> I didn't come up with that the same way that I didn't sew the Achilles tendon. Why is the Achilles tendon in the leg tissue wrapped on a spiral inward? So that when you spiral it outward like a spring, it holds integrity. Like it's right there in front of us and it's not debatable. And what you start to see is people don't want to touch on that. People don't want to have a conversation with me about how the spiral integrity is designed in the embryo, in the embryo every single time the same way. They don't want to discuss how everyone's Achilles is sewn on a spiral inward, which would make it a certain way that it has to load up on the, on the pattern of loading pressure. It's like, they don't, they don't do that. Instead they go, well, you're dogmatic. Well, you're lazy. You know, it's like, you're lazy then. If I'm dogmatic, then you're lazy. <laughs> and if we're supposed to be scientists and we're supposed to be people that are truly looking for the truth, then you should have an open eye and you should try to prove this wrong. 
do what I did, do what Gilly did, do what Gary did, do what all these other coaches like a Hunter or a Brian Gathright did where they tried to prove it wrong. That is where I would try to push people to do is tell me it's wrong. Go find me the inside ankle bone high shred. Go look at how the Achilles is sewn. Go think about the way that that fabric is woven through the system and then take the common sense approach to, well, how would you load it like a, how would you load it to keep integrity? It becomes binary when you start to look at it that way. We didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, it's inside ankle bone high. Why? Because I said so. Because I'm Rick Stanzi. He's like, no, dude, it doesn't work that way. You got to prove it. You got to show it in slow motion, just like they do in the golf world. And then you got to show it underneath the hood with the anatomy. And, and that's what we've tried to do. And like I said, if people aren't going to look, they're not going to look. But more and more people will ask questions because either they're forced to or it's in front of their face enough. That's a great thing, like you mentioned about the internet. It's just you're, the scrolling, the quick hits, the information downloads. It's now this, like we talked about at the beginning, finding this blend of like paralysis by analysis, but the need for that information as well. So like finding that in, like, I think we're in that world of like information overload, a little bit of paralysis by analysis, but so much good information being shared that on the other side of this, you're going to have a ton of truth that starts to help a lot of people. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. And, and that's in the coaching, golf coaching mm -hmm. and, and the fitness coaching world the same way. I, I think that both of them are, we, we've yes. been inundated with information for the last 15 years with, with the ability to measure things. And now it's like, okay, we have these mounds of data and, and we've, we've got it, you know, right, who, who's right. going to start to decipher this? And okay, this goes in this column and this goes, speaking of columns and sure. this one goes in, or silos and this one goes in this one. No, but, and then someone's going to yes. look at it and say, okay, which of these are interrelatable? And, and how does, and it, but, and there's thousands, if not millions of different uh, items in each one. And then all the, the, the differences in what you can interchange, it's like, it, it it might not be fathomable because it's it's compounding like compounding interest. They're they're getting more and more data, and all the different variables. No one's ever going to be able to, to use them all. But someone who is at least has the open or the empty cup to look at all of them and say, I you know we can again we can take parts from each one based on an individual's certain body composition or, or position that they're in in their sport. We can implement this from go to mm -hmm. and and this from X Y Z. And, and, and this person can just all of a sudden just go on this run. Of, I think of eventually the AI play. too. I think eventually it, AI it, is it's, going it's to, to do some stuff that it's going to be hyperbolic in a sense to where it's, it's the only chance to make sense of the endless. There's going to be so much that now it's like, yeah, well, there's going to be you, so you, much. You've at least categorized so many different data points, but because you're human, you don't know what to do with it. So now you're going to need an AI processor to kind of sift through and be able to tell you what is real and what is not. And like, that's kind of our argument is that, you know, you're always going to need the eye in the sky. Essentially, you're always going to need that coach's eye. You're always going to need that human interaction when it comes to, you need your caddy, you need your head coach. Like there's an emotional side to this that won't be mm -hmm. possible for the, for the machine to be able to tap into. Um, and so, you need that extra set of eyes. And they so need that extra it's set of using eyes. or working through that machine. It's like, you know, we, we need our iPads to see this. Like it's frame by frame. I'm not going to be able to break that down. I wasn't ever supposed to have to break this down because if you're in an environment where you're a butt naked barefoot tribesman, there's no woda there to code you into a bad position, right? There's no sidewalks and heavy shoes <laughs> and, and chairs. Like it's just a different world. Just nature. Right. So out, just nature. now that we live just in a, nature in a more you. comforted sort of, you know, climate controlled, if you will, uh, movement controlled society, we're able to always see comfort. And there's just collateral damage for that, that we weren't able to see. And I, I always use this analogy, like we didn't know, or they didn't know the cigarette was bad until you give it three decades to work its way through a population. They didn't know the chair was bad till they mm -hmm. gave it three decades or so to work through the population. They didn't know that the tight toe box, high heel shoe was bad. It's going to be this way with the lift. Same way that the processed foods are kind of having their day now, the oils and all the different things that are coming out in the diet world yeah. that are now being like, oh, well, we didn't know that in the early 90s. Well, now you're going to see this shift 
in the training world where it will be exposed. And like, we're not the only ones saying don't Olympic lift. We're not the only ones saying don't back squat. And the more people that you start to see come to that conclusion, you'll see more and more people. Like I said, it'll be a, a push towards more longevity and durability because the sports world is craving it. You know, you got these arguments in the NBA about load management. You got these arguments about turf or grass because the knees are shredding at high numbers. You've got these people in the golf world that are like, man, why are these young golfers falling apart? How do we keep these guys? So the questions will continue to be asked until those answers show up. We're just confident that we have those answers because we stopped asking, what do we think? And we started to do, like I always say, Gilly played National Geographic. Like it's so funny if you turn on a National Geographic, you know, documentary and when they go to learn about animals, what do they do? They go sit in the bush quietly and they watch, and they observe and they take notes and they see how it behaves Video. in its natural setting. Then after that information is devoured, then you could start to do a cadaver sort of breakdown of a dissection where you could then confirm and correlate with what you saw in the bush. So we've just done the same thing with Goda. Gilly did the same thing. He said, who's durable? Who's fragile? I'm just going to go watch how they moved in a subconscious environment. Well, the more durable people I look at, I, t I tend to see these global laws. They, t they more or less have straight feet. They all play this little inner ankle bone high setting at the foot. And then the knee points out and then points in. It's got this like spiral move to it. That started to show itself. And then the WOTA started to show itself. And then you go and you cross-reference it with the anatomy and you see things like, oh, yeah, well, the foot is sort of cascading like a roof down into the outside corner. Oh, yeah, the heel is the attachment point for the Achilles. And, oh, yeah, the Achilles is sewn on a spiral inward. So that would mean that it would have to do the bow. And so all this information coming in from a better vantage point, just a better hypothesis, a better question of, how does a body travel through space for a lifetime and never get hurt for no apparent reason? There's obviously a longevity sort of model built into it that we're missing. If I'm supposed to take six to 8,000 steps a day, compound that over a lifetime, it already implies that whatever that pattern is, it's got to have durability built into it. And then you start to look at, well, why are these joint replacement numbers so high now and they weren't so high back then? Like what's what all this data says something, it points to something. Well, when Gilly asked the right questions, mm -hmm. he got the right answers. And then that's just the reality of the situation is it's really just good science is the funny part about it is that. And then oftentimes when there is a disruptor in an industry, it never comes from inside that industry. Gilly isn't a, it's always on the peripheral and that's Gilly. He's no, a circular it's always on the periphery. On the outside. He's a, he's a license plate salesman that, that, that made his money you know, building uh, crazy fast ABC title. So he's on the outside looking in. He's like, what the hell are you guys looking at? You know, he's a guy that blows his back out at three levels. He's passing all these tests and this or that. He can't get healed by the greatest doctors in New Orleans. And then they're going to cage his back. And he's like, maybe let me take a look at it. And he goes and looks at it and he asks a really good question. And the next <laughs> thing you know, he stumbles on the right people to study. We're all studying the norms. It's like studying you know, you're studying the normal population. You're like, well, I guess high blood pressure is the, the, the normal. It's like, well, that's not the ideal. That's the normal. So there's ideals and there's norms. We are accidentally studying norms and considering them to be the ideals. Whereas Gilly actually found the ideal and then said, oh, shoot, the norm is really, really far from the ideal. And that's why there's, that explains all the ACLs, Achilles and, and shreds. Because once you start to look at those people, they all show up with the same pattern. And like we always say, Goda and Woda confirm themselves every day. I used to get irritated with, with the guys in the golf coaching industry in, in, that were in, engrossed in, in the middle of what they were doing and, and what they were saying because I was on the outside and I was saying, well, I, I know that these things d don't. Right. You're, you're not able to fix it and fit it in your box that you're trying to create. And there's these things that are different. And I used to get mad at them. And as I got older, I'm like, well, they, they were, yeah. there was only so much time in a day. And, and all right. So they're, they're teaching and they're also, I give them all the credit in the world now because they were teaching and they were going out and, and learning what they could about body and biomechanics and all these other things and how everything works. 
they didn't have time that I had as a young kid. I didn't have the responsibilities to say, well, let me take what they're doing and let me mm-hmm. go compare it to against some of these other things that I've learned. So it was wrong for me to, to speak, not speak sure. ill of them, but, but say, you, you know, you're full of shit in, in so many ways. Uh, I didn't, you know, I wasn't that blunt, but to, to, because I had the time to do it. And then, you know, as you progress and, and everyone progresses, you usually, I learned you either, you're either looking at the same thing and just, explaining it different or it there's i'm not going to use say that i was always right but i'll say in certain instances their understanding didn't come along enough and i didn't have enough uh expertise right. in how to explain it maybe correctly or know it well enough at that time i knew the people who did to get them to change their mind but eventually because it was the right thing that, yeah. that the industry gravitated that way so I, I, again, I, I see that, that you know, that yeah, appears it's, to be happening it's definitely with, with like, all systems. The as well. better we get at explaining it and the more simple analogies that we can, you know, bring to the table, like the, 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 the joystick analogy, like it, that's helped a lot of people go, oh, because they know what a joystick is. They can kind of conceptualize and, and we learn, we really learn and we understand through stories and through analogies and metaphors we memorize through vocab and through school. Like you've memorized tons of shit that you don't really learn and understand, but to truly learn and understand it's passed down to you through stories Mm -hmm. and through analogies and through metaphors and the old, you know, sitting around the campfire is where the true knowledge is spread. And so, you know, that's how we try to frame our teaching is if I can't explain this simple, then I don't get it. And so I'm trying to get simpler and simpler Whereas, and that's why I try, I just got off the phone with a coach today. And I was like, the cool thing about Gotha is that it feels like a lot at the beginning and it feels like com- complex. And what the hell are they talking this? As you get into it, it only gets easier and it only gets simpler and it only makes more and more sense. Whereas a lot of the other systems, they feed you this great marketing thing at the front end. And what I noticed was as I got into it, I'm like, where am I going? Like, I just get, I get lost in the, the bushes of, you know, yeah. just T I O N words, like Gilly would always say. You just where you're kind of like, well, why am I doing this? Well, dude, that guy's got a degree and he's worth more money than you. That's why you're doing it. It's like, no, no, I, I need like, I, I need some, some, some reason why I'm doing this. And there's never a reason why you're doing it. You're just doing it because, well, everybody else in the room is. And and, and then there's certain people that wake up to that. And then I think it's our job as educators as instructors to it's my job to continue to make it simple it's my job to continue to tell stories and to continue to create analogies and metaphors so that people can grab this information and they can take hold of it in a way that is digestible for them that they can actually make use of it right away because that's going to be the ultimate truth to this scenario that's what's going to flip it is word of mouth it's going to be the no the gays talking about it. It's going to be these high level mm-hmm. athletes going out and be like, no, dude, go to go to legit. Like it's not, it can't just be Rick and Gary saying it. That's always going to get pushed back because they're going to say we're biased. But if we have people like a Pete and we have people like a Jameis Winston, or we have people like a no to gay and they're like, yeah, I, I, I did some of the stuff and like, dude, it holds up and checks out. Like it's pretty good. Well then that person's kind of like, Oh, well, you know, then it becomes yeah, it's, it's sort legit. of the, the, you know, it starts to snowball and that's where it's got to get starts to, to snowball in order for It'll it to get to that snowball. way. We have to be very clean with our descriptions. We have to be smooth with our delivery and we have to make this easy and digestible because it really should be easy and digestible. It shouldn't have to take a four year degree to understand human movement. I should be able to get these coaches in two to three weeks to get a big picture view of what the hell is going on and to start make significant changes in not only their own bodies, but in their communities. <laughs> I mean, Dan, shoot, do you think we missed I could, anything? You know, I could pour another two hours. In. <laughs> you kidding me, man? This is my life. This is all I do. Just it, think about this. Um, I, I before I okay, I got some rapid fire for you. We'll wrap up with that before I, I got to tell you. So my mom was down. For mm-hmm. Chris, was it Christmas last year? Thanks, whatever it was. And she's having mm-hmm. she's, her, her ankle or Achilles is bothering her knee. And what I know about God, I'm watching her walk and, and she walks with her feet. Getting more, there, yeah. M- not duck footed, but leaning that way. And of course, her, her, her ankle, in, right ankle, uh, inside ankle bone gets low. So she, I said, Mom, you, you got to start walking like this. You got to get your, you know, your toes facing forward. And she tries it and she kind of blows it off. So she goes to the doctor. 
And I said, I bet they told you that the interior portion of your right Achilles <laughs> was starting to get stretched and torn. She goes, how did you know yeah, that? Yeah. I said, well, what do you think I've been telling you to do, mom? I mean, you, <laughs> you can go to some, now you, sure. you went there because of course they're doctors and I, I have the utmost respect that they know things that I don't ever know, but I know that the basic fundamental of, of the movement and the pattern that you're doing and, and where you're wrong. And if you do this, that will go away. So she, she's gone through enough now that, like most people, yeah, that she's coming around to. Oh, I, and every yeah. time I talk to her, like, "Mom, are you doing it?" Yeah, Don't I forget sometimes, but yes, I get back to, to it. So themselves. we'll see how I that progresses. Coming across yeah. these these stories come across my desk <laughs> every single day, and that's what I mean by that is it just keeps confirming itself. And that's the reality, though, is like I, I dude, it took me two years to get my dad to because they look at me like, well, he doesn't know. I, I've seen this kid screw up a million times. You know, you, your friends and your family are actually the hardest people. <laughs> to convince are the hardest. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And it, 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 even I've got her doing the cold showers now. I'm, I, yeah. For years I've been doing ice stuff. And, it is. And yeah. It's, it's, so it's, it's, that, it's that's all the rage now, the were ice you, baths. Were you introduced with I, the I've got her doing the, did you kind of, it, it was before okay. Wim Hof. I can't remember who got me or talked to me about it, but uh, about five or six years ago, because I did a, a video. Uh, I'll send it to you. It's kind of funny. Oh, I, on my screen in go. porch, I have a hundred gallon feed container and I just put some, I put a, about a yeah. tablespoon of chlorine. I got a, a, a pump just to circulate it. And uh, for less than 150 bucks, I was doing plunges in this five it's years ago, I think maybe. Sure. So, but it, yeah. it's cool to see it caught on now. Yes, it, it's awesome. Yeah, it's sure. awesome. Uh, you're ready to do some rapid I, I fire and down, get man. you out of here. I'm sure your kids are probably cussing me up and down. <laughs> All right. So the first one and the last one everybody gets because I kind of kind of keep some continuity, but everything in between is a little different. But uh, it, it's fun. Uh, so you uh, as a golfer, you are if you ever if uh, if you were in a Ryder Cup and you had Ooh, the walk up song to the first team, what, what are they going to play for you when you're walking up there? Eminence Front by The Who. I love that little like entrance, that little beginning of Eminence Front. Uh, that'd probably be the one that gives me like goosebumps every time I hear it. I'm always like, cause I think I'm like, dude, if I was a UFC fighter and I was coming out, what would be the song that would get me like jazzed up? And that's the one I kind of, I've always liked that too. All right, cool. Um, if they made a movie Ooh. about your life, who, what actors playing they made you? a movie about my life? What actor is playing me? Uh, Robert Pattinson. All right. Um, you a uh, morning evening. shower guy or evening shower yeah. guy? I kind of find myself gotta, now that I'm like saying it out loud. Like, well, to I took a morning shower like this. Like, sometimes it's a nice wake up. So I kind of get split 50 50 on that one, depending on how much movement's going on in that day. All right. Uh, if you could sit in a golf cart and talk to any person oh, throughout history uh, for an hour, anybody sure. you wanted to, who would it be? Yeah, like no doubt. I would. You just, know, he's actually the coolest. number one. That, that so far that on that question. That's an, uh, let's best see. Best cartoon of all time. Best cartoon man. of all time. If I just think back to growing up and like you know Saturday morning and what we used to watch. Like the the one that just was always on and the one we kind of always got the best lap. Tom and Jerry. Like Tom and Jerry was just good old fashioned. Like always good, <laughs> always entertaining. I, I I would go with Tom and Jerry. Okay. Biggest, uh, celebrity biggest celebrity in your phone. In my phone, uh, probably George Kittle would be the biggest name. I'm trying to think back. I'm sure there's a couple other NFL guys that have sprinkled in, but he's the probably the most household name that everybody would know would be George Kittle. Okay. Uh, a couple more. Favorite purchase in the last Favorite year of under $100,000. That's a good one. You're looking for like cheap, cheap or like. A anything. You're, you're, well, whatever you bought, your favorite thing that you really, you, you couldn't do without it that you, you say, yeah, shit, I, I can't um, believe I lost that if you, if you didn't have I'm like, it. I'm a shoe guy. Like I'm a sneaker head. So like, I love the Jordan shoes. So I've got a couple pair of Jordans that I love that, you know, those will push around a hundred, 200 bucks. But, um, when I find a shoe that I can like do everything in and I can play basketball in it and like move to and mm -hmm. from, they're my favorite. I got these pair of Nike air trainer ones 
that are like they're that old school like it looks like the Bo Jackson shoe. But yeah, like I love the shoe. Like I, I was yeah, I was gonna say the Bo Jackson. Like, Remember that one? Should I get it? Should I get the same shoe? Because I'm afraid that like it's gonna rip or something, and I'm not gonna have the shoe ever again. It's like one of those shoes where I'm like, oh, I finally <laughs> found something that I love having on the foot, and, it, and it's athletic. Like that's a shoe that was pretty cheap, and I've I've really enjoyed having it. As far as because I've been looking at shoes, trying to get the whole minimalist thing, but like I didn't like the way they look. So that's one I've been like I've been really happy with that purchase. That's been kind of cheap. Cool. And then the last one, as far as golfers, uh, this was then debated a little bit. Uh, it seems to be always in the discussion in the last couple of years. Who, Tiger. as far as go- the golfing world I is concerned, who's Tiger the goat? Woods. And maybe the, I mean the unfair part about that is I didn't really get to watch Jack play, and I'm sure those are the two that get probably thrown back and mm-hmm. forth. Um, I didn't really get to watch Jack play. Yes. And to be fair, I didn't. I wasn't like a big golf fan when I watched, you know, when, when, when Tiger was doing his thing, but just from what I hear and kind of like taking a step back, like, it seems like his sort of decade of dominance, if you will, was just unmatched. Like it's, it's never been done like that. And then, you know, you got to factor in like the injuries and kind of fallen, uh, you know, you know, because of that, um, I see it like Jordan esque where it's like Jordan didn't have maybe the longevity that you're seeing, Um, from a year standpoint of LeBron, but it's like nobody was more dominant in that time period than Jordan. Like nobody, they just, they transcended the sport. I think that's another Mm -hmm. part for me with the goat discussion. I think Jordan's the goat of goats, but nobody, when you're talking about goat, they got to transcend the game. And I think Tiger, like he opened the doors to golf in a way that probably has never been done or maybe could ever be done. It's like, I'm watching the tournament the other day. It's like, Dude, he might be like eight shots behind, nine shots behind. You get to watch every one of his shots. It's like nobody else does that for the other golfers, but it's like I want to watch those shots too. Somebody uh-huh. had on Twitter the other day a Mount Rushmore of golfers, right. and it was and it, they had Bobby Jones, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicklaus, and Tiger, and they said who would be on your Mount Rushmore. And I'm watching this, and I'm reading some of the responses, and as I'm looking at, it, I'm like, Tiger is like a, a mm. combination of. Arnold and and Nicholas because he he dominated like Nicholas did but right. he did it Arnold had that brought character. so much to the game I mean sure. just uh, Arnie Arnie put golf on the he map so with cool. TV I mean he 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 and TV came along together and he was so cool and, and Tiger what he did for the game with TV and the contracts and everything I mean mm-hmm. arguably equal so the, to, to me like he's like Nicholas, a combination like I got Nicholas's of book, both those uh, guys. I think it's Golf My Way or something like the oh it's so good and like. I just well, my love way. That's his the famous one. That son bitch was a competitor. You could tell. Like he had that. He's got that killer instinct. Now you ain't gonna be in a goat discussion if you don't have a killer instinct. But I always admire those types of guys and their their mm-hmm. the framework of their mind. And and you listen to him talk about each shot, and it's like they're so disciplined. So there's always something to learn from each of them. But yeah, I'm with you. I just think the way that Tiger transcended the game, it's like what Mike did for for sports. You know he. If Mike wears his shorts this way, we're all wearing our shorts this way. It's like he made shoes cool. Everybody's got contracts. He made, you know, it's like all that kind of, I think, ties into that goat discussion a little bit. I'm I'm very uh, yeah. high anticipation to it's see that cool movie story. coming out with it's Matt Damon. It's funny because the dude and, didn't even uh, want to be with me. Ben Affleck about Nike. And, and, guy. Yes, you very know, cool. It's funny when you look back. Yeah. With uh, Sonny Acaro, was, is, is Sonny Acaro is a, it was the guy, the shoe guy that, that signed all the kids. Yeah, he. Uh, I think Jordan. Not to get off topic here cool at the end, but right. uh, the I, Converse was the big the thing weapons, back yeah. then in the eighties. Now, Doctor J played them, and and Magic wore them, Bird wore them, and, and Jordan. I, he wanted them, and he, you're right. He, I think he did heavy. He was about to last, go to Adidas, last and then Nike said, "Hey, Netflix just let us have a chance." Like, there's one Mom, episode obviously, all that story is famous, basically. and it kind of gives you the backstory of all of it. But I mean, the iconic. Just to this day, this the, one of the most iconic sets of sneakers and still pushing that brand. But yeah, Tinker Hatfield, you know. The, and if, if you get if you like uh, documentaries, there, there was one on on Netflix, Abstract. It, it had it had seven part series, and it was all on different uh, artists. Had a photographer on one, the guy that does the New Yorker cartoons. Yeah, but there was one full episode on Tinker Hatfield. Yeah, they, all they, about the they, shoes, they made, and they like, also got into the, the Jordan story. It's funny because people cool. will be like, you know, shoes are ruining people. It's like, 
Well, Nike kind of played a role in that, even though like there are Nike shoes that they're, they're good. Like you can wear them and you can get away with them. Like I said, those air trainer ones, I got wide enough toe box. It's pretty flat. It's like kind of a deconstructed shoe. But then there's a lot of those designs that like you could tell they're going for fashion. And when you go for fashion, it's kind of like we see in the golf world with it's almost like a mm-hmm. dress business type design where it's not always centered around ergonomics, unfortunately. So kind of leads down. But yeah, the 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 icons, the sneaker icons is like I said, I'm a sneaker head. I, I'll always be I won't be purchasing minimalist shoes. I'll just be honest with you. I, I, if I'm going to buy, I usually buy Nike. <laughs> Cool. Uh, what do you guys have coming up? You have any classes coming yeah, up or so, on- online educational things? So first and things foremost, I would check go check out, out gotomovement.com. So gotomovement.com is going to be our home website. Um, we really have um, two spots that kind of, you know, branch off from gotomovement.com. One of them is literally uh, formatted through gotomovement.com. That's going to be Recode 225. So Recode 225 is our corrective and training website. So if you're looking to understand GOTA a little bit better, if you're looking to um, kind of correct some hip pain, knee pain, back pain, we got correctives in there. We've got education videos in there. And then we have what we would call the workout of the week, which this is going to be for those weekend warriors, those guys that are CrossFitters, but don't want to break down anymore. This is going to be a more challenging workout, but it's going to all be inside the math as we would call it inside GOTA. So that's kind of our training platform, a do-it-yourself um, the it's, it's 50% off your first purchase. So right now we've been running the code Feb 50 F E B 50. And that's going to, I think run out until the end of this week. Mm-hmm. And then from that point on, it will be start 50. So I don't know when this thing is. I think before we I'll, you know, maybe we can put it in the caption or something, but if you have questions, you can always go to go to movement.com and you can email us or you can reach out to me on Instagram, my handle is at GLS Gota underscore education. And so you can reach out to me there in DMs. But we do have a, it's always going to be this way where your first purchase on Rico 225 is 50% off. We've been using Feb 50. It's going to become Start 50 as the code. So um, I, we're kind of in a, right in the middle of a transition there. Um, but that's going to be sort of our chance to get people into the system. Um, get them starting to, to, to mess around with some of the movements. If you're looking to, to just get like an initial exercise routine, we do offer a free one free workout exercise routine with some PDFs. So all these concepts that we've been talking about and these ideas of inner ankle bone high and bow and corner um, back chain, we have a PDF with some nice images and some, mm-hmm. some simple definitions to kind of wrap your head around it. If you go to go to movement.com. There'll be a button that says, get your free guide. So you go in there, Pop in your information. You'll get these four exercises sent to you. They'll all be those basic groundwork exercises that I mentioned earlier on all fours uh, with, you know, video support. And then you'll get these PDFs to kind of help you conceptualize a little bit what we've been talking about today. So definitely go to go to movement.com, check out, get those free guides. And if you like what you're doing, go pop over to Recode 225 and start your Recode there. Um, like I said, if you're in, if you're on Instagram, uh, we're on Facebook as well. Follow us. Uh, at, at GLS Gota underscore education, we do have a certification. So all you golf coaches out there that are interested in kind of understanding the system a little bit more, understanding how to assess and how to correct, we have a, uh, an education program that's set up on GotaInstitute.com. And that's um, an education program that's all centered online. Um, you can you know do all that from the comfort of your own home. You have lifetime access to this education. It's going to be a table of contents to run you through the system in a nice chronological order. You watch each video twice. It emails you out a nice certificate. And then, you know, from there, you also get uh, access to a go-to coaching app where now you have access to pretty much all our corrective exercises. You can invite your, your clients in, your students in, and you can build little exercise routines for them so they can kind of, you know, be on track with, with their go-to homework. And then on top of that, you get an invitation to a lab weekend uh, down in New Orleans, which we run every other month throughout the year, pretty much. And those are like three day lab weekends. That's kind of like a you know a nice crash course to kind of finish up. It's it's optional, so you'll still get your certificate just by doing everything online. Like I said, we got coaches finishing a certain two weeks time, and then they'll come down to a lab weekend to brush up on some concepts. But we do also have coaches that are overseas that can't make it, so 
it's one of those things that's optional, but uh, always a good time to to be in person. So that's kind of our system. We've got go to movement.com is the home base. Rico 225 is the correctives and performance training, a DIY, if you will. And then go to institute.com is really the education that we're talking about, the certification, the the sort of the deeper dive than you would get on Instagram. And that's great for coaches. It's built for coaches, but we have a lot of athletes and a lot of parents that they want a better understanding. And they actually go and get that because they not only get lifetime access, but they get access to an app, which has all the correctives and they get, um, you know, the ability to come down to a lab weekend and kind of spend a little time and get some one-on-one training. So that dude last Man, year was a lot going on. I don't know how you get to play any golf. So I get it in when I can every now and again, there's a top golf function going on. Maybe every now and again, I get an hour. I can run down to the range over here. Nothing replaces 18, but man, Hey, business comes first. You know, our family comes first and then the business. And then by the time I got time for golf, it's like, I ain't got four hours to carve yeah. out. So that's been the toughest part. Thank God for uh, golf outings. Cause that's always a good excuse to get back together with the buddies and, and, and go out there mm-hmm. and, and get a, get around them. Cool. Mm-hmm. It's been awesome. Like at least hopefully this will shed some more light on go to people will look at it a little different, check it out some more. Yeah, I appreciate and, you. Uh, I, I really appreciate say, you I mean, coming appreciate on and, and doing platform this. And, and this has been great to have this discussion. Um, so just thanks for having me. We really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you.